What's going on, everyone? Welcome to episode 58 of the Data Driven Strength Podcast. Today is, I think, a pretty uh, interesting and, and unique episode. We have uh, a guest on. We don't have guests super frequently. We like to only reserve uh, these uh, highly coveted guest spots when we think they are uniquely uh, uniquely beneficial to a discussion and when we think it's it's more than just you know getting the same folks on to discuss the the same old things so um this this will also be the first time we kind of formally discuss um the uh meta regression that zach led on proximity to failure for strength and hypertrophy outcomes which if you're not familiar with the meta regression uh you're, you're probably going to get familiar today um so we have Greg Knuckles on, which which I failed to mention. Um, and basically, it's been interesting from from our perspective as the as two of of multiple authors on the meta regression because the the models that ultimately were the best fit models in the the paper have been used to kind of support multiple different camps, which which we found interesting. Um, and also the preprint process. It's currently, as of recording this, on its second version. It's currently uh, also recently been uh, submitted to a journal, and the the preprint process has allowed for some very fruitful discussions. Um, and one of which is has especially been the case with with Greg. And we think Greg provides a very uh, helpful and unique perspective in terms of the interpretation specifically of the best fit models that that we we got in our analyses. Um, so kind of the the way this will be structured is we'll give an overview. I'll, I'll, I'll pass it to Greg first to introduce himself and then I'll, I'll pass it to Zach uh, to go ahead and kind of give an overview of what we did. And then we'll probably get into discussion, a, a, a general discussion of interpretation and also potential mechanisms of hypertrophy and probably a lot of uncertainty there as well. Um, we'll probably touch on strength a little bit but that's probably a little bit less interesting. So uh, I will plug our RPE guide, which we have just updated. Um, so if you're listening to this, that means the RP guide is now on its version three. I believe the first one we released was in 2021. Version 2.0 kind of needed an update for a while, to be honest. Um, but we kind of waited until this analysis was done. Um, and the reason I, I mentioned that specifically is if you are interested in some of the theoretical rationale for why we think we see the practical outcomes that we do for strength, that's a great place to get hopefully a, a relatively straightforward, but also comprehensive overview of how we think about proximity to failure for strength. Um, so check out that, that link will be in the description on YouTube or, or your podcast player of choice. Um, and yeah, with that, Greg, thank you for being here. Um, I'll, I'll kick it to you for a quick intro. I don't think you necessarily need an introduction. I'm sure most listeners will be uh, familiar with you, but Let's hear what you got to say in, in terms of uh, what you do and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, thank, thanks for having me on, guys. Uh, you you certainly know how to butter a fella up. Um, my name is Greg. Uh, I have a website called Stronger by Science where I write about nerdy lifting related things. Um, power lifter, power lifting coach. Um, yeah, yeah, that's me. That's me. That'll do. Uh, you also have the effective reps article that you wrote. Was that 2021? Uh, man, I feel like it, I feel like it was older than that, but I'm I'm honestly not sure. Who knows? It's even 2019. Anyway, it's it's been a, a few years now, um, and I think that article and, and and other folks' work as well has been very important for both. I think I speak for for both Zach and I in terms of, of course, getting multiple viewpoints and and uh, kind of thinking through, you know, like the, the, the analysis that you did, Greg, and, and what other folks have done. Um, so that's definitely part of the reason why we, uh, we value your, your perspective here and are looking forward to, uh, you kind of being part of the discussion here, but with that, Zach, give us a overview of the meta-analysis, kind of why we did it. Um, why it might seemingly be a little bit different in terms of outcomes compared to, uh, other analyses and we'll take it from there. Sure. Um, so I've had a lot of practice with this uh, kind of elevator pitch of the methods. So hopefully this is the the most refined version of it. So I guess the the place to start here is just kind of the the initial idea of, of what we attempted to do and ultimately how that compares to the other meta analyses that have been done on this topic. So 
typically the way that these uh, this area of research is summarized is kind of through a categorical binary comparison, failure versus non-failure, right? And so typically a meta-analysis is going to compare the difference between those two conditions, summarize those through a procedure or a statistical procedures, and ultimately pop out kind of that summary effect size of the difference between the two conditions. Now, ultimately what that leads to is that you're categorizing a continuous variable in this case, which is RAR or proximity to failure um, that um, that is what we're interested in. And so the the most up-to-date meta-analysis that um, some people think seem to think is kind of at odds with with what we've done is, is by Martin Ruffalo and, and colleagues. And that was a really, really good meta-analysis where they took things even a step further and, and, and categorized things by failure definition, um, which is one of the biggest sources of ambiguity in this area of research. And they did a really nice job um, in doing that. And so the, the kind of the place we wanted to, to take the next step was go through some uh, procedures to allow us to explore, and I'm going to use the word explore pretty um, specifically, the dose response relationship between proximity to failure and the outcomes of interest. So ultimately, we're trying to get that nice summary curve of the outcome that we care about and RAR values, right? And so as anyone who's read this body of research, um, you know, study by study, you're going to quickly realize that the methods of each study are not um, detailed enough to allow us to do that, um, you know, right out the box. Right. So we basically went through a systematic but inherently subjective um, number of procedures to estimate the RAR for every single condition within the, the, the studies that were included in the inclusion criteria. And ultimately that's another important thing to bring up is that our inclusion criteria was considerably more broad than a lot of the other meta-analyses in this area. We basically tried to look for any study that directly or indirectly manipulated proximity to failure. So this included things like the velocity loss research, alternative set structures, um, studies that directly manipulate a proximity to failure, like the failure, non-failure research, and a whole lot more. So we basically try to find every study that directly or indirectly manipulated proximity to failure. And so at the very front of this, the estimation process is in something you kind of have to get on board with. So obviously from a face validity perspective, we wouldn't have done this if we didn't think we could estimate it from you know a decent perspective. And I think it, it does that, but there is that inherent limitation of the way that the RAR is needed to be estimated. So that's, that's something to, to note on the front end. From there, we basically went through this process to take the estimated RER values and relate those to the outcome of interest and kind of explore that dose response curve. We went through the whole gamut of different ways you could fit these, these models. And I think that's something that doesn't often get talked about is just the the numerous subjectivities that can kind of go in this. From the version, the first version to the second version, we simplified our modeling procedure and that ultimately led to marginally different uh, results in terms of what was the best fitting model. Mm -hmm. And so that's important to, to realize and important to underline how unstable the quote unquote best fit model really is. And so I think that's the first piece that kind of let us know that the the ultimate best fit relationship shouldn't be taken as like gospel. It's it's an unstable relationship that gives us a broad directionality of the way that these adaptations trend with proximity to failure. But as we'll talk about, the overinterpretations of exactly what that curve looked like can lead to some uh, potentially counterintuitive findings. Um, so, like I said, we fit a whole bunch of different shapes, linear, nonlinear models, and kind of popped out what was the best fit. Uh, one thing I want to hit on before we kind of talk about the actual results is that another thing that doesn't often get this stuff uh, discussed is kind of the overall quality of these models. So the the overall kind of you know measures of qu model quality uh, fit were modest at best. So that basically tells us that in these models, proximity to failure has a modest uh, kind of predictive quality, but it's far from the only thing that matters. And so that's another thing to very strongly keep in mind is that, yeah, we've observed some, you know, in the case of hypertrophy, a quote unquote meaningful slope um, from a statistical lens, but that's not at all saying that that was a very strong predictive factor in terms of the actual outcomes observed. Um, so that's important to keep in mind. And that's reflected in the kind of the uncertainty intervals and in literally every single estimate throughout the analysis. They're extremely wide. They often go on both sides of zero. And that can lead to some, you know, potentially counterintuitive predictions moving forward as we as we get more data.
So that's another thing just to keep in mind. Um, in, in terms of the actual findings that we found, and that's a not right way to say that, in terms of the actual findings, um, the relationship for strength and RAR, once the percentage of 1RM has been taken out of the equation, is basically null, meaning that independently of load, proximity to failure really doesn't seem to influence strength gains at all. Whereas for hypertrophy, gains in muscle size tend to improve as you get closer to failure. That's really, that is to me, the, the, the takeaway kind of message um, from, the, from the analysis, rather than you know, going in and over-interpreting the curve and comparing the exact effect size from failure to one RER to two RER and coming up with these large mathematical um, kind of calculations on how we should um, optimize proximity of failure. I would really stop at those directional statements given all the limitations that we've already discussed. Finally, um, we did two other things that kind of explore things further. We looked at a ton of different interacting moderators. So things like exercise selection, the load use, training status, um, the intended concentric velocity, all different kinds of things that could potentially also mediate this relationship in an interacting fashion. And we'll come back to, you know, a few of those that potentially were important. Um, and then also we looked at, um, because there was so little data greater than 10 RIR, kind of the way that regression models work, some of those really far out data points can kind of have unduly weight on the overall directionality of the estimates. So we went ahead and fit additional models where we only use the data points of 10 RER and less. And the thing to note there is that the slopes basically became less dramatic for both uh, hypertrophy and strength, um, but the same patterns um, tended to emerge. Um, so they seem to, to hold up when we only consider the data, you know, within the relevant RER ranges for the most part. Um, so yeah, that is kind of what we did in, in a broad um, fashion of what we found. I guess, Josh, real quick, did I, did I miss anything you think is important? Um, before we kind of move on to the actual interpretations and misinterpretations that kind of were out there upon this hitting, uh, hitting the internet. I think, I think that was a really good overview. Um, I'll point one thing out that you might have kind of indirectly said, but I think is, is good to help kind of bridge the gap between this overview here and a discussion of interpretations or, or potential misinterpretations. So the inclusion criteria specifically for the analysis was that the studies had to be volume equated in some way, but that gets tricky with proximity to failure, right? Because it depends how you, you count volume, right? Or, or how you define volume. Is it set volume? Is it rep volume? Um, because in, in practice, total training volume and proximity to failure cannot necessarily be completely separated, right? So the inclusion criteria is that the study either had to be rep equated or set equated. So let's just quickly give an example of, of those. So a rep equated study might be eight sets of five for a protocol compared to four sets of 10 with the same percentage of one rep max, right? Um, so that's not set equated, but it's rep equated. And I think, you know, that just kind of passes the sniff test in terms of, okay, that's, that's a study that definitely looks at proximity to failure. So we had both uh, rep equated studies and set equated studies. A set equated study would be saying, okay, I'm going to do three sets all the way to failure versus another condition that does three sets to two RER, right? So those are both kind of getting at the question of proximity to failure, but perhaps through a slightly different, fr from a slightly different angle. And, and the reason I want to bring those up specifically is I think it also adds color to the strength findings in the sense that if it's rep equated or set equated, um, they had to be also load equated. Right. So again, load seems to kind of drive strength gains, at least in the, the short to moderate term, i.e. The, the length of, of time that most training studies are. But for hypertrophy, I think understanding that both types of volume uh, equation, if you will, led to kind of similar, a, a similar relationship in terms of the relationship between proximity to failure and hypertrophy. So if you have only rep equated studies, and you see that uh, conditions that train closer to failure are le lead to more hypertrophy, that kind of permits the, the tentative conclusion that reps closer to failure are inherently more hypertrophic, right? Because the same number of reps at the same load were performed in both conditions, but one of them had those same reps at a closer proximity to failure. On the other hand, 
set equated studies, you can make the argument that if you see greater hypertrophy in the groups training closer to failure, that's just a result of more volume, right? So the reason I bring that up is, is you see relatively a similar relationship. If, if again, you have, if you look at just rep equated studies or just set equated studies, but kind of the, the, the downstream application of that or the downstream interpretation or the extrapolations you can make from that are kind of inherently different. And I think that's worth pointing out that estimation went into this, a specific inclusion criteria went into this, which um, if anything was probably more broad than, than other studies and the just lack of stability in terms of the relationships, I think it's just an absolutely vital thing for, for the listener to take home. Like the, the models that we have are not incompatible with, okay, I think there were 26 studies for hypertrophy. Let's say five or 10 or 15 years from now, there's double that there's 52 studies. They're not incompatible with a completely different relationship, especially as you know, we get Martin or Fall's study with very good failure definition and, and very good control of RAR. Um, and, and, and I'm sure that's only going to improve in the research at large. So hopefully that example is helpful for the listener to just understand and, and kind of nail home those points you made Zach about like, Hey, we see the, the general directionality of the relationship, but it's not something that like, Hey, this is, this is the nail in the coffin. This is exactly how much more hypertrophy you get with, with different RIRs or, or with different, uh, you know, set endpoints. If you, if you want to clean any of that up, Zach, let me know, but, but hopefully that's a, a good. No, that, that, I think that's a, that's a good place to, to kind of wrap up the, the overview there. And so I think that's where we can kind of begin to discuss the interpretations that have been out there. Right. Um, the, the biggest thing that I would say that I've seen kind of out there that's potentially been misinterpreted is just the, um, kind of directly taking the, the shape of the curve of the first version of the preprint in particular as, you know, the, um, not, not, uh, incorporating the instability of the relationship in mind and ultimately, um, using this to support some, some popular models that have been out there to kind of explain, um, hypertrophy outcomes when it comes to, um, uh, proximity to failure. And so that, that's probably the biggest one that we'll hit on in terms of, um, the, the different explanations of the shape of the curve. Some other ones that we've hit on is the, the, implications that this is related to um, saying that volume for, uh, doesn't matter or it's somehow in, in support of a low volume to failure approach. I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but the results of the, the moderator analyses quite literally exactly are opposed that. Um, it would say that training you know, closer to failure is obviously a positive input for muscle size, but also um, additional volume would also improve um, uh uh, hypertrophy outcomes. So that I don't think is a particularly strong, um, interpretation of the data. And then just the, the fact that there are interacting factors, right? Um, the biggest one that, um, in the first version of the preprint was, was kind of a meaningful relationship in all of the analyses, but in the second version was only in a few was just that of load. And so, training with, you know, heavier loads doesn't seem to require training as close to failure for hypertrophy to be, you know, quite optimized as training farther away from failure. So I think that's another um, important thing to kind of consider and the downstream implications thereof. Um, and then also just a few other things is that based on the inclusion criteria that Josh laid out, there were a few studies that are commonly kind of cited in this conversation that weren't included. Um, one of them kind of mostly on the kind of the non-failure um, proponent side is, is one from Carol and colleagues. That was a concurrent training study that was not load equated. So it wasn't included, but shows a pretty strong, um, effect in favor of take, uh, staying a couple of reps shy of failure, sometimes a lot of reps shy um, from failure. And then one on the other side, um, is one from Goto and colleagues. And that's just an example where they didn't, uh, report the raw data and the authors were difficult to contact, not, not from any fault of their own. It just wasn't able to get the, the data from them. So there's a couple of cases where certain data wasn't able to be included, um, which is another, uh, you know, limitation of, of the, of the study, but okay. With our scientific, uh, jargon and, and kind of summary out of the way, now we can kind of kick around, uh, talk shop here and, and kind of talk about some things that I think are going to be interesting for the listener and ultimately get us to 
reveal the principles that underlie our practical application, which I think is the the most interesting thing that kind of comes from this. Um, so I'm going to come back to the misinterpretations of the shape of the curve. So uh, ultimately, the way that this has been kind of interpreted is kind of what I would say the resurgence of the quote unquote effective reps model and, and, and suggesting that um, kind of the the way you can interpret that, there's kind of two versions that Greg, you've like uh, Josh kind of talked about in the intro. You did a really nice uh, article on this topic um, that will probably go through a lot of the kind of the, you know, the arguments and, and kind of the discussion related to. But there's really two versions of the effective reps model. And I think we're going to discuss more of the latter. But the first is just that gains in muscle size tend to benefit from sets taken closer to failure. And I would say at, at large, that's really what the, the, the analysis does seem to support, but that's not a particularly strong or challenging claim. It's just kind of um, observing the directionality of the dose response relationship, which we would tend to agree with. Whereas the kind of the quote unquote hard version of effective reps is that really the last five reps are the ones that contribute to hypertrophy given some other uh, conditions. So, um, Greg, we'll actually let you speak now. Um, what, uh, when you kind of saw the, the first version of the meta regression, kind of some of the discussions around this and kind of the theoretical models it was in support of or lack thereof, what um, kind of struck your eye about it? And ultimately, um, how does that kind of factor into the way that you view um, these kind of theories? Yeah. So, so just for the listener, um, the, the reason that, I'm the guest on this podcast, I think, is that um, when the when the first version of the meta regression was published, um, I saw a lot of people talking about it. And uh, the way that I saw people talking about it, I found very frustrating because it didn't seem to actually track particularly well with what even the first version of the meta regression was saying. Um, and it was in a way that I suspected you guys probably didn't fully dis or didn't fully agree with either. Um, so I, I started working on an article about it uh, that I that I was bouncing back and forth uh, with Zach, and finally realized like to fully do it justice, um, it would have needed to be way longer than I actually had time to write. So I just kind of scrapped it. Um, but yeah, that that was uh, that that's that's probably why I'm here right now, and a lot of those kind of misinterpretations of of the initial meta regression um, did have to do with with the shape of the curve in the initial meta regression and the interpretations people were drawing from it. Um, so, Zach, would would you like to just for, for the listener, kind of describe the, the shape of the reps and reserve versus hypertrophy curve in the initial meta regression yep. and the differences. Like I, th this, this would be much easier were it a visual medium. Sure. Um, it's, it's always great podcast content to yeah, describe yeah. graphs, 100%. but unfortunately I think it's, uh, it's unavoidable in this situation. For sure. Yeah, we definitely optimized for views around here. So we're just going to continue to talk about graphs all the whole time. Um, so yeah, in, in the first version, um, as, as we kind of discussed, we fit a bunch of different models. Um, but the one that seemed to be the best fit, um, which again was a razor thin advantage slash win, was this linear log curve that basically shows from zero to approximately two or three RAR, there's a relatively sharp decrease and then a less marked decrease as you kind of go throughout the rest of the range of RAR. And I think, you know, Greg and myself included, both kind of having read the individual studies, that's a little bit surprising. Um, I think if you go through all the other meta-analyses, pretty much every single summary effect size does lean in favor of failure. But, you know, there's limitations there. One of the studies is a pretty strong outlier. Um, some other things to consider there. But in general, um, there does seem to be an advantage of failure. But I think most people are a little bit interested in that being the exact shape that I ultimately shuck out as the, as the best fit. 
Um, in the second version of the preprint, it was linear, um, and and we simplified our modeling procedure to avoid um, overfitting basically our our, our mm -hmm. number of studies, and that ultimately kind of made things a bit more conservative, um, which I think is good for interpretation. But that initial version, which is kind of when our conversation began, Greg, was the, um, the that linear log curve that basically shows as you reach you know the last couple reps to failure there is a market increase in hypertrophy stimulus. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, the, the chatter I saw about that, that, uh, that did tend to frustrate me quite a bit was essentially like you alluded to before folks just interpreting that trend line as the only finding of the study. Um, and also kind of like misinterpreting the trend line itself. So to, to get into that a little bit more, um, it was, it, it was, it was taken with much glee by folks, uh, promoting what, um, what you previously referred to and, and what I referred to in, uh, in the draft of the article that I sent you as the hard version of the effective reps model, the idea that it is really just like the last five or so reps in a set that stimulate hypertrophy. Um, and so essentially, uh, if, if you look at kind of the full scatter plot of results um, that the trend line was trying to model, um, you see that, so essentially a prediction one would generate from the hard version of the effective reps model is at, that if you train with more than five reps in reserve, you will not stimulate any hypertrophy at all. Um, or like, yeah, maybe a little if someone's completely untrained, but like, basically it shouldn't be effective. Like you're doing no effective reps. Um, but I mean, like the vast majority of individual data points with five plus reps in reserve were still positive effects. Like most of them did find, uh, you know, training at six, seven, eight reps in reserve, you're still pretty reliably seeing hypertrophy. Um, and in fact, I think the largest single effect size in the entire meta regression was at like six reps in reserve, which should be zero effective reps and therefore completely ineffective training. Um, and so, yeah, like it, it seemed like a lot of the interpretations seemed to ignore um, the data that the model was based on. And two, uh, you know, even that initial linear log curve, the kind of mean modeled effect uh, for the trend line itself was still very comfortably above zero, uh, all the way out to, you know, 10 plus reps in reserve, um, which again would seem to, uh, push back pretty strongly against the, the hard version of the effective reps model. Um, and so the, the reason I found it particularly frustrating is it came across a bit like a Mott and Bailey arg argument where, in effect, like you are going to promote the hard version of the effective reps model. You say, oh, like the, the last five reps before failure are the ones that truly stimulate hypertrophy for these uh, like discrete mechanisms that, that we're going to lay out and explain to you. And like, it, it seems um, essentially like it's interesting, like were the hard version of the effective reps model true? It would be like genuinely uh, interesting and tell us something neat about physiology and generate useful, actionable predictions. Um, but the meta regression doesn't really support it. Um, so the the proponents of the hard version of the effective reps model kind of went towards the soft version, and they're like, "Oh, look, it, it looks like these last few reps before failure." do seem to be quite important for hypertrophy. Therefore, this supports the effective reps model. And then, you know, like, let's not let's not talk about the fact that we are seeing robust hypertrophy in situations where there should be zero effective reps. And as soon as we've shared this, this graph, we're just going to go straight back to talking about the hard version of the effective reps model. Like the, um, just to like define a term there, a, a Mott and Bailey argument um, is the idea that like, there is a uh, like an in, in interesting 
audacious and wrong version of something that you want to argue for, but you know you can't really support it. Um, so then when you're kind of in public and, and talking to a more skeptical audience, you go towards um, like a more acceptable and it just kind of like broadly broadly acceptable version of the argument you're trying to make like in a way that will go down a little bit easier um like a you know an example is like if someone was like a, a hardcore libertarian what they might want to argue for is like oh let's like get rid of the entire federal government but you know they're what they might say in polite society is like oh we should lower taxes a little bit uh, and then if folks are like, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I would like taxes to be lower. They then are like, oh, look, like all of these people are also libertarians like me and also want to abolish the entire government. You know, like that's that's kind of a, a classical example of a Mott and Bailey argument. Um, and, and like that term comes from like medieval architecture. <laughs> Essentially, like the Mott was like a um, kind of like the the large kind of area around uh, a castle that wasn't all that uh, like protectable, but is kind of like the area that a, a principality would like to control. And then the Bailey was like the more fortified version in the interior. So essentially like when you're challenged, you retreat to the Bailey, like the, uh, the more defensible version of some position. But then as soon as the challenge is gone, you go back to the Mott, kind of the more expansive but less less defensible thing, um, and so yeah, that's that's how I saw your meta regression being used, um, and I I didn't like it uh, because one I think that's um, a little bit intellectually dishonest, uh, and two, as someone who's a fan of accurate and intellectually honest research interpretation. Um, I didn't think that your meta regression really did support the, the hard version of the effective reps model. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's, that's what, what kind of generated my interest in it. Josh, you gonna say something? Yeah, I was trying to unmute myself, but, uh, I think we finally got it. Can I get, can I get something a little bit off my chest here? Um, sure, sure. So ba basically what we saw in, in version one, and Zach kind of mentioned how in version two that has been submitted for publication, the, the best fit model effectively changed. But again, we mentioned that the, the st that just goes to show that the, uh, the stability of the relationship, the best fit model is, is not entirely clear. But either way, uh, what our meta regression generally showed is that, you know, that, that Direct, that directionality in terms of training closer to failure, benefiting hypertrophy. Let me make two points. The first is that, first is that I'd say, man, Zach, when we first met in, it's like 2018, something like that. We, we, we were definitely counting like effective reps. Oh yeah. Reps and, and Calculator we were, baby. Yeah. Um, 10 sets of three at RP nine optimal certified. Yeah. Yeah, and we we were trying to even worse yet we were trying to apply it to to strength training so that was an interesting time and then i'd say maybe maybe from that time period 2018 or so through maybe 2020 ish 2021 we kind of swung the other way specifically talking about hypertrophy here um i think we were closer to right at that time um because but but basically, we took a position that I think kind of resembled like, uh, you know, like in the, in the mass research review, for example, uh, Mike Zordos kind of took the position of like, hey, hypertrophy can be ma maximized quite far from failure. And, and we kind of aligned with that, I think, a good amount. I think we did a good job at that time emphasizing the importance of high loads in that sort of application. I think we were really thinking through the, the powerlifting lens. But nonetheless, we were definitely not in... We had kind of done a, a 180 on the the effective reps thing for for hypertrophy. Um, I think with this analysis, we we've probably come to a healthy middle ground. I would like to think. Um, so that's the the first thing to say is that these results surprised us. Even from reading every single you know individual study multiple times and and trying to put the pieces together ourselves, and then when you actually put it in a 
statistical model like this, you know, there are multiple factors that can, again, influence the, the best of the model. So that's, that's the first thing I wanted to, to get off my chest. The second thing is that I've seen a lot of people directly compare it to um, one of the figures in Martin Rafalo's meta-analysis. Um, and I'm having a hard time with this tab on my computer, so I can't tell you the exact figure number it is. But basically what you see is they have on the x-axis roughly proximity to failure, and then on the y-axis effect size of, of muscle hypertrophy. And you kind of see the opposite of version one of our, um, of our meta regression. And people kind of put up the, the two figures side by side, right? Martin's kind of showed that, or, or seemed to show that, okay, you see greater hypertrophy and then it kind of plateaus as you get closer to failure. It's, um, it's figure five in that paper. Figure five. Thank you. Thank you for the assist. Um, but that, that was a, a conceptual figure, if I recall correctly, based on kind of some more categorical type of, of variables. I think they plan to do a sort of meta regression. Um, and I don't think they ended up doing it. Um, but anyway, that wasn't necessarily a, a meta regression. It was kind of a, a grouping of general categories of closer to failure based on failure definitions. And then further from failure, I think based on like some of the velocity loss stuff. The, and the, the X axis isn't scaled using interval data. It's categorical. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So while the, 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 those figures, right? Figure five versus our main model are seemingly the opposite. The result, the, 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 the analyses were inherently different. And I, I think that's just something that I have kind of seen so many times and I, I don't think it's a, an accurate representation of how the, the two analyses can kind of work together. Right. Um, I think Martin's paper was awesome. Uh, Zach, I think the paper that you led was awesome. I think they're just different approaches and we wanted to explore the continuous relationship between proximity to failure or RAR, um, taking some liberties in terms of doing our best to estimate the RAR of each study, um, to try to get an idea of the, the general relationship. So all that's to say is we were, we were surprised by what we saw. Um, but it's also not incompatible with some of our, our thinking beforehand. Um, and Zach, obviously you've been a little bit more, uh, in the weeds with kind of comparing it to, to Martin stuff. So I'm not sure if you, if you have any follow-ups there. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, that was an extremely common comparison and I think ultimately the the best word to describe like you said is kind of conceptual like i think what they did was quite literally the best they could have done with their with the data that they had like i think that was a really honestly i thought that when i first saw it i thought it was like a really clever way to kind of get at it given what they had to operate with but unfortunately the inherent limitation is that without quantifying the actual RAR of each one of those conditions that fell within each one of those buckets, like Greg said, it's the difference between interval and categorical. Like you can't necessarily place those on the, the X axis in a perfectly ordered fashion because you haven't actually quantified the RAR values there. Um, so, you know, just as an example, the velocity loss research, depending on the load utilized can completely change the RAR associated with a given velocity loss threshold. So just placing those, um, based on the percentage velocity loss on that axis isn't totally accurate. And, and I'm not saying what they did was a bad approach. Again, honestly, I think it's a pretty clever um, way to get at it. But you would need to directly quantify the RAR with each one of those conditions just as that is one of the examples. Another example is within the non-failure um, kind of bucket obviously there's a range of RERs that went into that. So some of the ones that were contributing to the effect size could have been on the way closer end to the, to the momentary failure end of the spectrum. And other ones could have been way farther away that could have basically led to an entirely different conceptual shape, which is exactly what we tried to follow it up with basically. Right. That's like the, the way that our piece fits in. So, so yeah, I think that was, um, that's a good, uh, thing to mention, like they aren't at odd, odds with one another at all. In my opinion, it's just a different number of studies, a completely different statistical technique. And we took a ton of subjective, but systematic liberties to try to do what we did. So I think that's the, the, the correct thing there. 
But okay, with that out of the way, so I think I think it's uh, probably good to to kind of mention why some of these models get so latched onto in the first place, and and people people want to know what is the best way to predict hypertrophy outcomes, right? Like that, that is what people want to know. And so I think over the years, you know, the, the kind of the evolution of how people have tried to track training volume or probably better um, quantified as like the stimulus for muscle growth has been shifted over time. I, I know Greg, one of the the older articles on your site, but honestly is pretty commonplace at this point was the, I forget the, the actual author's name that, um, uh, basically brought the hard sets, um, kind of, uh, Nathan Jones. yes. Okay. There we go. I just want to make sure he gets his credit. Um, so that, that was, that was, you know, that's been pushed as kind of prior to the stock standard kind of approach to, to count training volume now. And it's shifted from, you know, the Warren bomb meta analysis from, however long ago when they were counting total repetitions and now counting hard sets is kind of the stock standard practice and, you know, a savvy individual, particularly, I think those that come from a mixed goal kind of interest, whether that be powerlifting or like power building or whatever you have, where you are completing some sets of less than five reps. I think that's where you kind of get that conceptual, like how this doesn't seem like we can just count all sets the same, right? Like we need to, um, you know, have some sort of a more granular explanation of how to count these uh, sets. Also, if I'm not taking all my sets to failure, how does that impact things, et cetera? And so I think that is a charitable case from where this has came from. And I think it's a natural extension of that desire to have a good predictive, uh, <laughs> people like numbers, that, that, that nice, neat uh, metric that you can track in a spreadsheet to, to proxy the hypertrophy stimulus. And I think that's what's led to the prevalence and the, um, the, uh, yeah, prevalence is just the best word of the effective reps model in the first place. I think it provides a, in, in theory or in concept, it's the next evolution of hard sets in, 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 in at its, at a, uh, at a charitable presentation of, of what it's attempting to do. And so I guess that's where, we can go from there is ultimately defining what that model would um, use as its kind of underlying premises. And then ultimately potentially we can go through each one of those and talk about, you know, areas where we may agree areas where we may disagree. And then we can kind of come out the other side and then see if we can use that kind of conversation to drive, maybe it putting forth a, a different perspective and ultimately how that's going to drive our practical applications. So, with that, unless you guys have anything else to say, I think we can kind of go through Greg maybe presenting your interpretation of what the the hard effective reps model. Obviously, we talked about kind of the practically facing uh, what it entails, but I guess maybe more of the premise, premise, conclusion kind of uh, oriented um, approach to it. So if you guys have anything else, let me know. But that's kind of the direction I think makes sense. Yeah, I, I did. I did just want to add a couple things. I think um, one is is that when it comes to people looking for for variables like something easily trackable to predict hypertrophy outcomes, there's a there there is a long history of that. Um, like you mentioned, you mentioned hard sets, um, but like plenty of things came before that. Like there there was the uh, the time under tension craze back in the day. Um, there was volume load, which was used as kind of like the standard thing that you would quantify in the research up to, God, probably like 2012 or so. Um, like I, I might, like I'm, I'm not that old, but I might be revealing how long I've been following this stuff. Um, there was a, there was an acute muscle protein synthesis paper by Bird. Um, where so it, it used to be thought that both like uh intensity like like so back in the day people thought oh like you you need to be above a certain intensity threshold like defined in terms of percent of one rm um and like volume load is really important 
And so it, basically the idea was like, you need to be above at least like 60% of one RM, give or take. Um, and beyond that volume load is like super important. And there was a, a muscle protein synthesis paper by Bird, I think in 2012, where um, they compared like sets sets to failure with like 90% and 30% of 1RM on knee extensions or something like that. And I think they found similar muscle protein synthesis uh, following both of those interventions, um, which one was surprising to the folks who thought that volume load was super important because obviously people did way, way more reps with 30% of 1RM, volume load was higher and was like pretty surprising to the people that thought that there was a relatively high intensity threshold you needed to clear because 30% seemed like it, it did as well as 90%. Um, and then, but folks were like, ah, oh, that, that's just a cute data. And then they followed it up with a longitudinal study comparing 30% versus 80%. Um, and is still like pretty big differences in volume load, uh, above and below that kind of like classical 60% intensity threshold found similar hypertrophy. And so that, that kind of like opened the door to more things, but, but yeah, I mean, number of sets, number of reps, uh, time under tension, volume load, now effective reps. Like there, there has been a pretty, a pretty long history of people looking for just kind of like single number metrics that they could use to, um, like, serve as a proxy for the hypertrophy stimulus that someone is going to achieve following a particular workout. And I do, I do think a lot of that just comes from kind of a, a the natural human desire for closure and uh, lack of comfort with the unknown, um, which for the most part, I'm like totally chill with like, that's uh like th that's like that that's just a normal part of being alive um and it serves a purpose you know like if you stop and think about it like you don't understand hardly anything happening to you in your life um one, one of my buddies uh gare bin shout out gare from ireland really really good dude um one of the things that he said that he does like if he feels like someone is bullshitting him is he just asks them why seven times like if if someone says like oh like this is something that's going on oh that's cool like why is that and they offer an explanation it's like oh that's interesting like why is that like explain it a little bit more and you kind of for for almost everything you believe if you take that not even like seven steps down but like three or four steps down you you begin to realize like oh wait like they're i'm just going through life with a lot of like assumptions that may be bad assumptions. I don't know if they're supported or not, but like if I, if I tried to like really figure out everything, I never get anything done. You know, like you, you need a certain feeling of certainty to progress through life and get anything done and not become a complete basket case. But why that frustrates me a little bit in this context is like, if if I were to see a, a gym bro, it, like th this isn't an if, I see this all the time. If, uh, if someone, you know, they're just like a trainer or they're a lifter or whatever, and they're, they're still on the, um, they're still on the time under tension train. They're like, oh yeah, like this is like super important. Like this is the only thing that matters. Like, I don't care. Um, like I really and truly do not care because like just to skip ahead a little bit, I don't think that there's any single number metric that you could use to to like pretty accurately predict the hypertrophy stimulus you're going to get from a workout. I don't know if there ever will be one, but if there ever will be one, I don't think we're particularly close to knowing what it is. Like I, I think at this point, the best we can do is just get like an extremely rough approximation. Um, but yeah, like you know, if, if someone is is like non-academic and, and they're just looking like they, they can believe whatever they want. Like I truly don't care where it gets under my skin is when something like that is presented as like scientific or like quote unquote evidence-based or based on the research or based on the literature and is put forth 
with an undue degree of confidence because like the whole point of research and science is to approach things from a perspective of epistemic humility and to approach things from a perspective of lacking confidence. Like you don't know things, which is why you're applying the scientific method and investigating things further. And like fund fundamentally, you're looking for questions, like a, a definitive answer. A, not many of them exist. And B, generally when you think one does exist, it one gets you a Nobel prize and two, you find out 20 years later, it's not actually a full answer. You know, like, uh, like fucking general relativity, you know, like that's, that seemed to be like the answer to gravitation. Um, and like, you know, Einstein is remembered and will be remembered forever for that. It's like, okay, like we, we have an answer now. We've been asking questions about this for so long, like since Newton and before, and like now we have the answer and this is incredible. Um, and th that was both like cool and also kind of like, well, damn, like this is kind of boring. Like cosmology seems to be solved now. And then you find like quantum mechanics 20 years later and it's like, oh shit, now there's way more unexplained stuff. And it, and this doesn't seem to mesh with like uh, general relativity all that well. So like, ooh, more questions to ask. Let's spend $30 billion on CERN. And now, now those people are, are wanting an even bigger particle accelerator. They're like, CERN's not big enough. Like, we're so close to finding dark matter. We just need to mash particles together even harder. Uh, very cool stuff. But anyway, like, that's that's how science is, like, supposed to work. And, like, evidence-based thinking is supposed to work. You know, you're, you're supposed to try to learn what we currently know. And instead of taking that and putting a bow on it and saying, okay, like, we have the answers like why even do more research on this stuff? Like we, we know that this is like the thing that's causing hypertrophy. We have the metric we can quantify. Um, there, there should be kind of at the heart of that, a, uh, a comfort with uncertainty. Uh, and if anything, a desire for uncertainty, because that's what spurs you to asking more questions and learning more and expanding human knowledge. And so I, I do resent, to some extent, um, any sort of, of, of thing like presenting itself as like science communication or like evidence-based recommendations that instead of like attempting to ask more questions and inspire curiosity, um, instead like trying to close off a road and saying, hey, no, like we, you, you, you don't really need to ask more questions because we do have the answers here already. Um, and that is especially the case, like in an instance like this, where there are still like so many open questions. Um, and so, yeah, uh, that may may have been a little bit rambly, but uh, yeah, ho ho hopefully there was something useful there. But yeah, I, I, I think that, that fundamentally people want to be able to quantify this stuff because they want closure. But I think if you're presenting yourself as like a science communicator, like an evidence-based practitioner, um, cl closure shouldn't really be what you're after. Like you, you shouldn't be, you should be looking for the tentative answers that we can draw now, but like ultimately you should be looking for the next question. Yeah. I think there's a, a, a positive relationship in terms of uh, degree of direct involvement with a project and the level of uncertainty by which the uh, findings or conclusions or interpretation are communicated. Um, you know, I'll just, just using the meta regressions that, that in question here, right? I think some folks spoke with a lot of certainty regarding the the application. And then, you know, you listen to Zach on, on Revive Stronger, or whatever the case may be, there is an increase in terms of uh, the, the level of uncertainty. And, you know, go, uh, fa uh, sorry, rewind to that time period in, in 2018 when we were kind of probably looking for, for that closure that you mentioned, Greg. Um, that was a little bit before, you know, Zach and I got experience putting the, the gel in the ultrasound probe and, <laughs> you know, having subjects come in and, and you hear on, on podcasts like this about, you know, people going through breakups during training studies, 
um, or their dog dying, right? And you're like, ah, yeah, that's like a, a one-off example. And then, you know, you, you, you're involved in a few training studies. You're like, oh, that actually happens, right? And, you know, thinking about some of the within subjects research that we've either recently completed and, and will kind of be out soon or that we're currently in progress of, you know, you see you're with these subjects multiple times a, a week and, and you see some folks grow like a weed, some folks grow like a weed in, in one leg, some folks grow like a weed in, in the other leg, um, some folks don't grow at all, right? And it just, it's its honestly been, I think, a challenge uh, to, to be transparent for, for Zach and I kind of going through that outside looking in period when we initially started to, to talk about research on the internet in some form and probably having higher confidence in things because you still need to train, right? And you still need to, to make calls and you probably need to have some degree of conviction to make it in, at least somewhat interesting. Um, I think there's a, probably a subset of, of folks that uh, hopefully uh, some of them have found this show because I think we, we try to put the puzzle pieces together as opposed to, to telling you what the puzzle pieces are and where they go. Um, so I, I think that's, that's worth internalizing for the, for the listeners. Just, yeah, that the, the complexity of the physiology, the complexity of research, and especially with hypertrophy, this is something that Zach and I were talking about earlier today, actually is like, I think from a coaching perspective, I almost feel like the, the, the individual level uh, kind of puzzle is more complicated for strength, but for, from a research perspective, the number of unknowns is higher for hypertrophy. Part of that's just due to like number of studies. Um, you, you could do a one or M in, in the seventies, right. And, and report that data. Whereas, uh, methodology for, for measuring hypertrophy has only improved. So. I think our interests from a research perspective have kind of leaned on the hypertrophy side recently because of a lot of that uncertainty, a lot of those unknowns. And that's, that's not that, that, that uncertainty isn't going to go anywhere anytime soon. Uh, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll try our best through our, uh, we, we, we do our best to have some degree of st statistical power, but it's, it's, uh, it's still far off from, from anything to make clear conclusions, even when you put, all the research together in a, in a continuous analysis like Zach did here. Yeah. Well, and I mean, I, I think that the research as it exists does uh, invite, and I would say necessitate a high degree of uncertainty, especially around this topic, like just to get back to it a little bit. I mean, like, God damn, dude, like the, the prediction intervals for this model, like you, you take, you take all of the data on this topic that exists you put it into a single meta regression model and you have prediction intervals um, that like at zero RAR span from like negative 1% change in muscle size to plus 20. You know, like if you, if you can look at those prediction intervals and be like, yes, I'm like, you got to figure it out. <laughs> I mean, I'm totally confident about the precise relationship yeah. between proximity to failure and hypertrophy. I don't know what to tell you. Like, I, I don't think we're looking at the same data. And if we are, I don't think you know how to read a graph. Like that's, <laughs> you know, like, and, and that, that is kind of the state of the literature broadly. Um, uh, outcome data is like outcome data doesn't tend to be like super, super clean and have like super clear answers. And as I think we're about to talk about, um, there's still like so many open questions with mechanistic stuff that it's it's truly wild. And I, I don't think people like know or appreciate that. And a lot of that is is in part due to the fact that like, you know, when when we talk about mechanisms of hypertrophy, um, we're talking about things that are happening in dynamic cells in living creatures that a lot of things, like you, you can't investigate a lot of things unless you were to remove tissue and be able to kind of like separate out proteins, look at it under an electron microscope, whatever. But then once you've removed that tissue, it's not in the dynamic living thing anymore. And so you can get kind of that snapshot, but you can't, you can't observe how that single piece of tissue changes over time. And like, what precisely is causing those changes? 
Just, um, just as an analogy here, um, Greg, not to cut you off, that I think yeah, would be a sure. little bit uh, – th- this was a good example to me to just like – put some caution on a lot of the the physiology stuff. Cause I think anybody that gets an, into research initially, I think you go through this kind of dynamic um, kind of curve of what you're interested in. Like, Oh, this, all this physiology stuff definitely relates to longitudinal outcomes. I'm going to know the physiology, like the back of my hand, that's going to definitely predict how all this stuff works. Okay. Muscle protein synthesis is maximized in these conditions. Therefore, that's going to be the best for hypertrophy. Get to the meta-analysis of the longitudinal outcomes and not even remotely the same a lot of the time as the, the, the mechanistic stuff, right? And I think one of the examples that people will probably be familiar with that they can kind of lash onto as an example here is a lot of the fiber type stuff. So mm-hmm. I think if you listen to uh, Dr. Andy Galpin talk about this, who is probably the, the foremost, the uh, you know, fiber type kind of, uh, expert, um, that people are probably familiar with and, and, and following that line of research, I think is really informative just to understand that, Hey, you know, you got sports commentators on ESPN talking about fast twitch, slow twitch, and kind of are familiar with that parlance, but then you get all the way down to kind of keeping up to date with like, how little we actually know about how to appropriately type a fiber, how it can be different across the longitudinal nature of that fiber. We have um, the actual techniques associated with with uh, typing a fiber and its mouse and heavy chain uh, content is basically mashing up an entire group of fibers and grossly assigning, um, you know, a fiber type value to those. Like there's just so many limitations to actually saying within a human being that this portion of a muscle fiber located in your quad at this exact position is this exact phenotype like that's impossible and but you hear a lot of people talk confidently about different changes to that to that uh that outcome and and things like that whereas the exact methods and if you listen to somebody who does that research of counting fibers staining fibers taking fibers out of a out of a muscle and performing all these analyses it is messy and it is not even remotely super duper clean. So I think, you know, that that just like that concept. And, and when I when I reference like the people talking about ESPN, the reason I say that is because theoretically that's been one of the very foundational concepts of muscle physiology is we got the white fibers, we got the red fibers. And every textbook, you know, is going to start with that kind of general gross classification. So theoretically, you would assume we got this concept figured out, man, like we got bedrock stuff that got has these these methods absolutely fine-tuned we know exactly how all this works when that couldn't be further from the case so take on top of that dynamic systems longitudinally adapting to some sort of stimulus that we can't even quantify as we've already mentioned now we're (laughs) we're now we're seven steps removed of things we're comfortable quantifying and understanding every single input into the system so i think that's just a conceptual example for me that keeps us, you know, like, like you said, with a sense of humility to understand where we're at with understanding some of this stuff. Greg already mentioned, basically the only way that we can study a lot of these mechanisms is removing the fiber out of the dynamic system in the first place, which is going to have a ton of different feedback mechanisms to counteract maybe some of these things we're observing um, out of the body. Right. So that's, that's just another primer to say like, Hey man, if you, if you think we got it all figured out, I don't know if I tend to agree. <laughs> well, and, and even just for a more direct example here, I mean, like if, if we were interested in cellular mechanisms, we'd probably remove uh, a small batch of fibers and uh, homogenize it in some way, try to extract RNA or like a certain protein fraction or like, uh, who knows, whatever. Sure. Um, but like, you know, you're 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 looking at at mechanisms and adaptations and like a relatively small number of fibers um and you might relate that to uh fiber hypertrophy over the course of like a 12 week study but like fiber hypertrophy and whole muscle hypertrophy are poorly correlated for unknown reasons <laughs> like you yeah, that's like another thing. Like you can't measure that same fiber twice, right? Like that that's like another thing I kind of think people don't actually think about is you biopsy an area. You're removing that tissue. Like yeah, you can't if anyone you wants can't... to get really sad. Go, <laughs> go, go to uh, a paper from Cody Hahn, a critical evaluation of biological construct skeletal muscle hypertrophy size matters, but so does the measurement 
go to table two. Yeah, that, that that's look, exactly what I had in mind. <laughs> look, at, look at look at the relationship, and then just uh, yeah, come come back and, and tell me. You're exactly creating more black pill stuff. bills on here, man. <sighs> man, like sometimes I read that paper and I just get like so excited about muscle physiology. Some sometimes I read that paper and I'm just like I just want to like throw everything in the air. So anyway, continue, Greg. Um. Yeah, I think I think that's that's about all I had to say on that. Uh, actually, I don't know. I do have one one more like slightly cynical thing to say before before we get into this. Um, I I do think that kind of the the popularity of more simplistic models for muscle hypertrophy. Um, I I, th I think that there's a reason for that. Like I I think that there's a reason that um, yeah I, I think there are several reasons that kind of our perspective of just like hey this shit's like very complex and if we can know anything we have to know it very tentatively and there's still so much uncertainty so many open questions. Um, I think that there are some good reasons why that's not the popular. Uh, the popular thing getting out there. Um, one is that you kind of have to hold someone's attention for a long time to make them sufficiently uncertain. Because uh, <laughs> like, again, it is just kind of like a default thing that people like closure, they like certainty. And, um, you know, to like, th this is going to be a pretty long podcast episode, and I'm going to have a lot of things to say about open questions related to mechanisms of hypertrophy. Um, and, you know, I think you have, you have like smart, uh, very with it listeners. Yes, I'm pandering right now. Um, that, that would be open to that, but you know, the typical, like if you go to just a standard commercial gym, you're not going to find many data driven strength podcast listeners. And uh, I, I think there's a reason for that, yeah, you know? It's not. It's not that it's not good content. It's that, um, you know, people people oftentimes are seeking out information to make them more sure and confident about what they're doing. And so, if you're trying to be more rigorous and throw some water on that, a minority of people are wired to like and appreciate that, and the majority of people aren't. Um, and so, therefore, uh, wh whether intentional or not, um, for for the people kind of like putting forth and promoting these ideas, it does tend to be more profitable to uh, to go with kind of the more simplistic, dumbed down to the point of being wrong uh, ideas, just because like it's, it's going to connect easier with people. One, because it takes less time to communicate. Like you only need to hold someone's attention for three minutes to communicate like a really simplistic idea to them. Um, and two, like it will increase their confidence rather than decrease their confidence. You increase their confidence. They're like, oh, this must be an expert because they, they made me feel good. And I like listening to people that make me feel good and fulfill my psychological need for closure. Um, and so, yeah, like whether, whether intentionally or not, um, there, there are kind of those like social forces, um, uh, incentivizing more more simplistic ideas and and helping them like go viral get big get popular um like a, a great example of this would be the idea of like the carbohydrate insulin model of weight gain and obesity um like very few actual serious researchers uh like looking into yeah like the obesity epidemic and like factors contributing to overeating and appetite regulation and all of that, blah, blah, blah. You're, you're going to find extremely few of them that buy into the carbohydrate insulin model. Um, but it is extremely popular uh, just kind of in, in broader fitness culture uh, in part because it's, it's very simple and easy to understand. Like you can give someone a 30 second elevator pitch for carbohydrate insulin model um, but if you wanted to talk about kind of like biopsychosocial influences, uh, like <laughs> affecting desire to eat and the relationship between desire to eat and actual eating behavior um, and how that interacts with like 
uh, exercise and how exercise interacts with like total energy expenditure. Cause like, you know, uh, then you're getting into the idea of like additive versus constrained models of energy expenditure. And then how that also interacts with energy balance. And like it, if you're trying to like be accurate and not like super simplistic, it gets very complicated, very quick. And yeah, like you, you can't really give a 30 second elevator pitch for, physiological regulation of, of eating behavior and weight control, but you can for carbohydrate insulin model. And so one of them gets way more popular than the other. <laughs> um, and so I think, I think that something similar, uh, might be going on here. Um, so yeah, let's, let's get into it. I, I feel like that's, uh, are we going to say enough wind up probably too much wind up, but it is what it is. Just the right amount. You guys have listened to the Stronger by Science podcast. You you knew what you were getting into when you invited me on. Spartamine uh, version two, baby. Let's go. Let's do it. Hell yeah. <laughs> um, cool. I think I can can lead us into the next area here, Josh, unless you have something to say. I can't tell you're paused. Okay, cool. Okay. So, yeah, let, let, let's go ahead and discuss the the kind of, like I said, the the potentially underlying premises that lead up to the ultimate practical facing model of the quote unquote hard version of effective reps, where the last five reps are the ones that contribute to hypertrophy. I think I'll run through the, as I understand it, and you guys can correct me where I'm wrong, the kind of mechanistic rationale of it. And then we can dive into support, not support kind of go with, go through those point by point. So as I understand it, the idea of the, the quote unquote hard effective reps model are as follows the basically necessary conditions for meaningful amounts of hypertrophy to our occur are a few things. One is going to be near maximal or maximal motor unit recruitment. Two, would be a slow involuntary contraction velocity. So basically, despite maximal effort to move the implement as fast as possible, the contraction velocity is slow. And three, that you're accumulating enough of that to reach the sufficient dosage of meaningful hypertrophy to occur. So, you know, the maybe only doing one rep um, that's slow is not going to be a sufficient dosage. Maybe you got to get a sufficient dosage there. And they're defining the actual practical, uh, the practical threshold of what you're observing to meet those conditions is the last five set uh, reps to a set to failure. So those are the, those are the repetitions that are meeting those uh, conditions with the assumption that when those conditions are met, that is when a high mechanical tensile force is being applied to each one of those recruited fibers, particularly um, controlled by the highest threshold motor units, which are going to control theoretically the fibers that are going to be the most propens uh, have the highest propensity uh, for growth, and that is what is going to lead to the predictions um, that we'll see in the, the longitudinal hypertrophy research. Just as a basic example, that I think is a good example to be charitable and show where this this model would have a correct prediction. With, with, and, with again, to be clear, the, the idea that mechanical tension is, um, for all intents and purposes, the only variable here that's like actually like directly and causatively stimulating hypertrophy. Sure. And, and just as a basic example, again, we'll get in the nuances of this example, but one practically facing example where this seems to succeed is if we take three sets to failure twice a week with 80% of 1RM and three sets twice a week with 30% of 1RM. Each of those are accumulating those five effective reps at each one of those sets. And that is going to help predict that hypertrophy stimulus ultimately. Hard sets does that as well. But the, you know, the advantage here is if we start factoring in different RARs, then that may better predict differences in outcomes in theory. Um, okay. That's my kind of best pitch. Anything that I'm missing there in terms of the underlying kind of premises that lead to the practical endpoint. I, I think that nails it. Yeah. Th th thumbs up for me. Um, I mean, we, we kind of, or, or Zach, you just kind of outlined getting to that point of high per fiber mechanical tension. Um, and I think where, where it might be worth going next is 
there is that that's all well and good right but there are multiple steps that are required to to go from that point to an actual increase in in muscle size right? josh one thing detail the difference real quick between at least the way we generally describe it the difference between whole muscle and per fiber force whole muscle and per fiber force yeah so if you think about the the basic force velocity relationship um basically your ability to produce maximal force is highest at slow contraction velocity so um this is best represented with a single contraction if you're talking about whole muscle force right so your force production is going to be highest with a with 100 a very slow uh single on the squat for example right and then it's going to be lower with 50 percent things get interesting though when you start to differentiate between whole muscle forces and per fiber forces across a a multi-repetition set right um so if you just think about the force velocity relationship on the whole muscle level across multiple repetitions if if you take a literal interpretation of that force velocity relationship basically your conclusion would be that the highest forces are at the end of a set but then you just take a step back and, and you think about it for a second you're like that just doesn't make sense it doesn't make sense why whole muscle forces would be the highest when you've just done a bunch of reps that are fatiguing you but the important differentiation here is the difference between again whole muscle forces and per fiber forces so if you're using i think the, the best way to illustrate this is a, a pretty long set right so er, uh, earlier in that multi-repetition set uh whole muscle force capacity is the highest but only some muscle fibers are going to kind of be in the game and then through a concept called motor unit cycling eventually as some fibers theoretically kind of fatigue out or no longer are contributing to a high degree to force output um, the per fiber uh, forces can be quite high near the end of the set even though whole muscle force is theoretically at its lowest throughout the set and then if you think about that force velocity relationship on the per fiber level, you can say, okay, the contraction velocity is the slowest um, on a fiber level near the end of the set. And thus the force on a per fiber level is the highest. And thus the tensile stimulus is the greatest with closer proximities to failure. Right. Is, and, and, yeah. And that would be, that would be basically the, the assumption of the model is that basically mm -hmm. all, all I wanted to clear up is that there. Yeah, exactly. It is, uh, all the only thing I wanted to clear up there is that it can just be confusing. If you think about force on the whole mu muscle level, you know, force equals mass times acceleration versus what's happening on the fiber level. And those are just two distinct concepts. I think for the rest of the kind of chat here, we'll probably mostly focus on the the per fiber level force and whether or not that that kind of line of reasoning actually holds up um, at the end of the set. So, okay. With that, Greg, I will kick it over to you. I think the, the spot of the conversation that I think we can, we can get started on here is kind of the caveat that you mentioned is that it seems to be a, additional premise here that the mechanical stimulus is really the only directly causative factor of hypertrophy. And, and from, from, uh, you know, what we've discussed, it seems like that's where you may have, uh, you know, some, some things to bring up initially. Yeah. Yeah. I do. Um, so first let's, let's take like 45 steps back and ask, what does it even mean for something to be a directly causative factor for hypertrophy or just kind of like a, a mechanism of hypertrophy as, as people kind of typically think about it. Um, and I, I think, I think a lot of the, uh, appeal of the effective reps model and a lot of the confusion that might be generated does have to do largely with how people how like people out there on social media might think about this stuff versus how like a scientist would think about it and how these things are like discussed in the literature. Um, and so I think, I think basically um, if someone were to say that like uh, tension is a directly causative factor or a mechanism of hypertrophy, 
the idea is essentially like it's a pretty straightforward A to B to C relationship. You generate sufficiently high tension with a fiber um, that is going to directly stimulate muscle protein synthesis. You do that over a period of weeks and months, and that muscle protein synthesis accumulates and eventually results in muscle growth. Like it's a pretty simple A to B to C relationship. You have the stimulus, which is tension. You have the acute outcome, which is muscle protein synthesis. And then you have the longitudinal outcome, which is muscle growth. And that is um, to some extent true, but also woefully incomplete. Um, so what's actually happening uh, and how tension contributes to hypertrophy um, is that tension is sensed by some sort of mechanosensitive structure, which we're still not even sure what, what those actual like mechanosensitive structures are that feel the tension to then like transduce it into some sort of signaling cascade that ultimately results in muscle protein synthesis. But there, there are some like candidate uh, proteins that, that might be those actual mechanosensitive structures. Um, and so essentially they would sense um, tension uh, in a way that like the tension generated by the muscle fiber would change the conformation of that protein in some way, um, probably in some way that, that would kind of reveal a binding site that wouldn't be revealed otherwise. So then other proteins can kind of like get in there and interact with that mechanosensitive protein. Um, it's probably some sort of kinase, which would mean that it would phosphorylate downstream proteins, phosphorylate a protein, change its structure and function. Now it can do other stuff that it wouldn't otherwise, like it's kind of a secondary messenger system. Um, and so then those proteins that interact with the mechanosensitive proteins probably get phosphorylated and then they can go interact with other proteins. Uh, and there's like six or seven that, that are probably progressing along in a line until you eventually get to mTOR or mTOR C1, um, which is kind of at the center of the classical hypertrophy signaling cascade. You have things that are upstream from it uh, that affect proteins that eventually all interact with mTOR. It kind of like summates and like tries to interpret those like upstream signals. And like, I'm, I'm giving like agency to it, but like, you know, it's, it's a protein. It's, it has no intelligence. It's just kind of interacting with the proteins that are interacting with it. Um, and then based on kind of the sum total of, of the, um, like inhibitory and stimulatory signals that, that the mTOR signaling complex is receiving, it will then uh, phosphorylate downstream proteins that then interact with other proteins. You have another like six, seven, 12 steps. Uh, and eventually um, <laughs> that results in uh, some sort of effect on myogenic regulatory factors that affect gene expression. Um, and so then gene expression, like you're, you're reading genes, you're creating messenger RNA that is going to code for the various proteins that uh, the signal that, that was created by the stimulus that was kind of transduced through this entire signaling cascade. Um, you know, eventually the message that is received is we need to create some proteins to, to do something. Um, so then the genes are read, creates messenger RNA to code for those various proteins, including the contractile proteins that primarily contribute to hypertrophy. Um, and then that messenger RNA needs to be uh, translated by ribosomes, which is kind of like another factor because uh, ribosome density can vary. Um, the translational capacity and like translational efficiency of each ribosome uh, can also vary. But, you know, that's kind of like the last step of acute stuff. And hey, now you've, you've generated some proteins. Um, and then uh, over time, hopefully you, you accrete enough proteins that, uh, that measurable hypertrophy occurs. But, you know, it, it's not just kind of like tension is sensed and then just kind of directly you, you start synthesizing proteins. There's like 
like dozens of, of steps of kind of like feedback and regulation at all steps in that process that could either amplify the signal created by that tension stimulus or dampen the, ten, the signal created by that tension stimulus. Um, and, and just like a variety of things that could ultimately like cause that stimulus to result in net accretion of protein or really not much change in protein. Um, and so, yeah, like there are like multiple other in inputs that influence all stages of that process. And what I described like is still like massively oversimplified. Uh, so like, for instance, that, that what I walked you through is kind of like the classical mTOR dependent signaling cascade, but there are also like mTOR independent signaling cascades um, that, that can influence uh, muscle protein synthesis. Uh, there's regulation of gene expression by epigenetic modifications that will ultimately influence kind of like once the signal gets all the way to the nucleus and you're saying, hey, let's let's do some gene transcription, that's going to affect how accessible those genes are to be read and ultimately result in messenger RNA. Um, there are bioenergetic considerations and substrate availability to think about. Um, satellite cell activation, myonuclear accretion, kind of the translational capacity of the cell. Uh, ultimately, if, if you're getting a bunch of myogenic regulatory factors saying, hey, we need to make a bunch of proteins, but you have kind of a finite number of nuclei that they're trying to knock on the door and say, hey, let me in. I need to transcribe some of your genes. Like that, that could affect how much uh, messenger RNA you end up creating. Like I mentioned, there's like ribosome related factors. What is your ribosome density? What is the translational efficiency or, or yeah, translation, translational efficiency of, of each ribosome? Um, like it's, and, and like that's still just scratching the surface. Like th those are all factors that go into it. So like ultimately I would argue that nothing causes hypertrophy kind of in the classical sense that people think about causation um you know like a, if, if you think about it in sort of a like simplified physics problem like if you uh hit a cue ball with a pool stick uh the the force that the that the pool stick exerted on the cue ball causes the cue ball to roll it hits another ball, it transfers force that causes the other ball to shoot off in a certain direction at a certain velocity. Like that's kind of how we, like we often think about causation as kind of like strict um, mechanical processes like that with very few additional inputs influencing them. Like it's very A to B to C to D. Um, but in a like massively complex biological system like the human body or like a muscle cell, um, there's just so much else going on. So like when we think about a, a stimulus for hypertrophy, like you, sh you shouldn't, I think, really call it like a cause um, or like a mechanism in kind of the classical sense more so it's it's just an initiator or regulator of massively complex biochemical processes that aren't fully understood and i think all of that is relevant because um a a reductive and exclusive focus on tension um just as like the driving mechanism of hypertrophy I think followed from a very influential paper um, that was misinterpreted, I think largely because people just didn't understand the terminology being used. Um, but that paper, the title was Stimuli and Sensors that Initiate Skeletal Muscle Hypertrophy Following Resistance Training by Wacker Hage and colleagues from 2019, probably butchering the name, but apologies if I did. Um, and so like that was the paper that I think um, really gave rise to, or, or at least like gave a lot of popularity to the idea that it's just all about tension. Because previously the, the paper that a lot of people cited was the uh, Mechanisms of Hypertrophy article by Schoenfeld that argued that tension, uh, metabolic stress and muscle damage uh, 
were all like mechanisms of hypertrophy. And I think the terminology was pretty loose in that paper as well. Like I wouldn't necessarily refer to any of those things as mechanisms of hypertrophy, but that was kind of like, that kind of laid the groundwork for a long time. I think that paper was from like 2010. Then in 2019, uh, this paper by Wackerhage was looking again at sensor stimuli and sensors that initiate skeletal muscle hypertrophy. And through that lens, they found that like, ah, like there, there are probably some like specific like sensor proteins that can feel tension and initiate that hypertrophy signaling cascade. And we don't really see that for metabolic stress or muscle damage or really um, like any other sort of like external stimuli that or, or external stimulus that you would generate from a resistance training session. Um, but like in effect, they were just looking for like specific proteins or structures or molecules that could directly sense the, cell the cellular perturbations induced by resistance training and then initiate, kick off that cellular signaling cascade that I described earlier uh, that eventually results in hypertrophy. And like I said, they found that the prime candidates for those sensors um, seem to probably respond primarily to tension rather than muscle damage or biological stress. But it is important to note and make very clear that initiate doesn't mean fully calls. Essentially, it gets that whole process rolling, but there are still so many like different steps and openings where other like factors can regulate and either suppress or amplify the signal that is initially generated by whatever is kicking off that cascade. So it could be entirely true that tension is the only exercise related cellular perturbation that initiates the cellular signaling cascade that ultimately influences hypertrophy signaling. But that still doesn't get you particularly close at all to establishing tension as directly causative of hypertrophy. Uh, and it's even further from, from getting you to the point of being able to say that it is like the only factor that's influencing hypertrophy. Um, so like just to zoom out a little bit, uh, rather than, than speaking about like mechanisms or causation or whatever, I think it's I think it's useful to think about it in terms of necessity and sufficiency. And so now we're we're kind of taking a little stroll down to uh, like philosophy and logic 101. So um, you you can when you're when you're thinking about like causations or like con contributors to some sort of complex outcome, um, it's helpful to ask like what is necessary and what is sufficient. And so if something is necessary. That means the outcome of interest doesn't occur unless a particular stimulus or a particular factor or whatever it may be is present. Um, sufficient means that the outcome of interest will necessarily occur if a particular stimulus is present. So, for instance, um, oh man, I shouldn't I shouldn't have just tried to to uh, freehand an example here. Um, something will come to mind, but. For, for our purposes here, the, the Wacker-Hage paper um, d would support the idea that tension is necessary for hypertrophy, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't come particularly close to establishing it as sufficient. Um, so, okay, okay. Um, an idea of necessary is like to, to drive in your car. It is necessary to have gas in your tank but having gas in your tank isn't sufficient to drive because your car might not have wheels or like the ignition might not work. So you would say that having gas in the tank is necessary, but not sufficient. Whereas, um, Shout out Elon. Oh yeah. Uh, or, or have a charged battery, you know, for, for a classical gas engine. Uh, <laughs> let's see. But, uh, an idea of sufficiency would be like, um, uh, yeah, like to, to catch a murder charge, you need to kill someone. You killed someone, that is sufficient to catch a murder charge. You know, like it, it fully satisfies the criteria. Um, not the best example, but whatever, it works. So essentially, like there, it, as, as the 
stimulus as the prime stimulus to kick off this signaling cascade. We, we do have pretty good evidence that tension is necessary, but that doesn't come particularly close to establishing that it is sufficient uh, or, and, and you could have something that is sufficient that could still be like amplified or muted by other things. Um, so it comes even farther from establishing that tension is the only factor here that matters. Um, and I think that that should be, like, like, that sounds pretty abstract, but I think to make it a little more practical, all of that should be pretty obvious when you just take a second to think about this. So, for instance, um, nutrition is clearly important. Total energy intake, total protein intake, they certainly influence hypertrophy. Um, but, so, like, they are also necessary, but not necessarily sufficient. So, and how do they influence hypertrophy? Well, they don't directly influence how much tension you can generate, right? Uh, but they do influence multiple steps of that signaling cascade between the point of initiation of the signaling cascade, which is caused by tension, and the point of actually synthesizing new protein. Like the uh, signals related to total energy availability affect kind of like things downstream of mTOR signaling. And so... Uh, you could have the same tension stimulus, but ultimately you get a smaller signal leading to like mRNA creation and, and actual protein synthesis if you're in an energy deficit. Because even though the stimulus caused by tension is the same, uh, like downstream things are modulated to result in a different outcome. Similar with protein, um, like protein itself like directly interacts with mTOR signaling. And it's going to just influence like substrate availability. Like you, you need those amino acids present to synthesize proteins from amino acids, right? So um, yeah, so just, just as one example of like tension being necessary, but not necessarily sufficient because you need energy, you need protein. Um, steroids are another good example here. So they clearly increase muscle growth. But again, not because they directly influence how much tension you can generate. Um, they might over time, like after they help you build more muscle and have more contractile proteins, but that's just kind of circular reasoning. Like they help you get bigger because they've already helped you get bigger, right? Um, but rather like they directly influence gene expression on their own, independent of tension. Like, um, that's how steroid hormones work. They go into the cell, they bind to an androgen receptor, and the ligand receptor complex translocates to the nucleus, affects gene expression. Um, and th they, like steroids, also influence multiple other steps of that signaling cascade between the point of tension generating a signal and that signal ultimately resulting in protein synthesis. Um, phenomenon of muscle memory is also a good example here. So like it's pretty well established that if you build some muscle and then take some time off training and lose the muscle, you rebuild it faster than you built it in the first place. Um, even if you've lost strength and can't generate as much tension anymore after the layoff, like you're, you're building muscle faster despite generating less tension. Um, and again, like it's not a matter of like that affecting how well you can initiate the signal that ultimately results in hypertrophy. It's a matter of everything that happens between the initial, the initiation of the signaling cascade and the point of ultimately synthesizing new protein. And in that case, um, there's research from, from Seaborn showing that it affects epigenetic modifications, which like I mentioned before, uh, like one, once you have those myogenic regulatory factors that influence gene expression, that kind of, makes it easier or harder to like get in to like transcribe mRNA that codes for a particular protein. So like you can have a similar signal, um, but like if that DNA is more or less accessible, that could affect like how much protein you ultimately synthesize. Similarly, it seems like um, myonuclei stick around even if muscle fiber size goes down. So your translational capacity per unit of fiber volume is higher. So again, like it's clearly influencing hypertrophy, doesn't have a goddamn thing to do with the actual, like, initiate the tension related initiation of that signaling cascade. Um, 
I feel like I'm I'm beating a dead horse at this point, but like I'm just going to I'm I'm going to give a couple more examples, like For just sure. to like hammer this point home. Uh, capillary density. So there was um, there was a study by Snyder's back in the day um, looking at the relationship between capillary density and hypertrophy in older adults, um, where they they basically just put everyone on the same training program and then looked to see like, hey, what's kind of predictive of outcomes after the fact? And they found the folks that had higher capillary density um, ultimately saw more hypertrophy than the folks who had lower capillary density. And then more recently, there was an experimental study in younger adults that I found like particularly fascinating. They used a within subject unilateral design. Uh, both legs had a 10 week resistance training intervention, but one of the legs did six weeks of unilateral cycling beforehand. Um, so, you know, like that's, that's cardio. That's, that's not going to build muscle. And like it, it didn't, um, it's not like one leg started way bigger than the other. Cause they did six weeks of unilateral cycling, but basically two legs on the same person. So like you're equating for sleep and nutrition and everything else within subject. Um, but just one, one leg had done six weeks of unilateral cycling. So it came into it with higher capillary density. They found that that, uh, also influenced hypertrophy where, like the, the leg that had done the unilateral cycling that came into it with higher capillary density experienced more hypertrophy than the other leg did. Um, so yeah, like that seems to influence hypertrophy again, without affecting fiber tension. Um, because again, like it's, it's affecting downstream stuff and it's not entirely clear what that is. Like it could just be, um, like making substrate more available. You can clear waste a little better. Um, it could be like higher mitochondrial density, maybe rather than capillaries, like affecting redox status, uh, and like that affecting like, um, amplification or suppression of, of multiple steps of those signaling cascades. Like it's hard to say, but again, like it, it it's not a tension stimulus, but like that factor is influencing hypertrophy responses, uh, NSAIDs and inflammatory status, just as a, as a final example here, um, NSAIDs, once again, don't influence how much tension you can generate. Uh, if you if you pop an Advil, like it's not like your squat's going to go down 20 kilos. If anything, it might even acutely increase how much tension you can generate. Um, if you have like orthopedic issues and like suppressing feelings of discomfort could help you push a little harder, or just if you... Um, like perceive the the burn associated with exercise is particularly noxious. Um, like NSAIDs could help you like maybe push a little harder and generate more tension. Uh, but then does it increase your hypertrophy outcomes? Well, maybe like it's dependent because uh, it seems like inflammatory status affects, again, multiple steps of those downstream signaling cascades between the point that you initiate the, the signaling cascade with attention stimulus and between that point and when you ultimately synthesize proteins. And so if you're like young and healthy and have like relatively low levels of baseline inflammation, it seems like taking high doses of NSAIDs uh, blunts um, hypertrophy signaling and ultimately how much muscle you build. Whereas there's uh, research on older adults finding that NSAIDs may actually increase hypertrophy. So Again, like you have another factor here, just probably general inflammatory status, which is modulated by NSAIDs that is ultimately affecting how much hypertrophy you achieve despite having the exact same stimulus and initiator of that stimulus, uh, that being tension. So um, j just before I keep going, do you, do you guys have anything to add to that? I'll, I'll just quickly summarize. Like I think ultimately what Greg just kind of went through. And I think we share very similar thoughts is ultimately the, the kind of common, the common narrative around this is that I think Greg summarized it initially really well, the A to B to C model where you have the tensile stimulus that is going to essentially directly reflect the upregulation of muscle protein synthesis. And then that mathematical, you know, balance of breakdown and synthesis reflects the hypertrophy that we observe ultimately. Mm -hmm. And the way that I basically just take everything you just said and maybe simplify it for the listener to 
kind of a mental picture is, you know, we have the, the arrow of, of tension that is ultimately sensed by the, the structures of the, of the, of the mu- muscle fiber. But then there's this big ass box <laughs> that the arrow has to go through mm-hmm. before it comes out the other side and is ultimately going to lead to the protein synthetic response that we actually observe. And within that box, you have holes on the top and the bottom for all these different regulational factors that are going to reflect the stimulus that is sensed and the ultimate consequent biochemical cascade and signal that is delivered finally to the synthetic pathway. And like Greg said, there are (laughs) dozens upon dozens upon dozens micro regulations that are occurring along the entire string of that process that leads to the simple tension of 10 units equals 10 relative units of MPS probably is a gross oversimplification and very likely leads to inaccurate predictions. And I think just, just, just to hammer home one of the examples that I think I know people will be able to identify with is that if you deliver the same tensile stimulus in the in a dreamer bulk in in scenario a you know your gomad starting strength type type situation versus in in situation b where you're doing a protein modified fast for the the third month or whatever something stupid that energy difference is going to be obviously a regulating factor of the 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 line of the tension stimulus to the actual mps that we observe and then the final um, the, the hypertrophy that actually is accrued from that over time. So clearly as Greg just laid out, there is multiple inputs to this process that leads to while tension may be a very strong or even potentially sole initiator, the actual process itself that we're concerned with that leads to the longitudinal outcomes that we care about is clearly very multifactorial and influenced by a ton of different things completely unrelated to tension. So saying that tension is the only thing we should really concern ourselves with and ultimately design training to reflect that is probably short-sighted. And I don't know if you guys have anything more to add to that before we keep moving on. Yeah. I just want to make a quick point regarding, you know, you might listen to, to what Greg and Zach have said and maybe think about the difference between between subjects considerations or between individual considerations and, and within participant or within individual considerations. Now, Zach actually uh, led a preprint that's that's out now that kind of talks about the difficulty of establishing kind of this this these causal inferences within an, within an individual. So I'll start by adding a layer of caution. Um, but if you want kind of a an, an overview of some of the nitty gritty stuff beyond the obvious things like steroids and uh, you know, like whether you're in a dreamer bulk or not, uh, there's, there's another paper, I believe out of, out of Auburn as well, kind of similar group of papers to what we alluded to before. It's called physiological differences between low versus high skeletal muscle hypertrophic responses, responders to resistance exercise training, current perspectives and future research directions. And they're very clear that there's uh, inconclusive research for a lot of these and, and, um, I think this paper was like from 2020, so there's, there's additional information since then, but, um, and, and Greg alluded to most, if not all of these, right. Things like, uh, satellite cell, uh, dynamics in response to training, things like capillary number pre-training and, and potentially capillary responses to training, um, mitochondrial volume, um, ribosomal upregulation is also a big one. And th- the reason I mentioned that is. I think that that goes to show that, you know, from A to B to C, there's a lot of sub steps, if you will. Right. And it would reason to believe. And and if you see these differences in terms of how these factors might influence between individual differences between low and high responders, it would reason to believe that if you can uh, modify these via some sort of training strategy that's either unique to the individual or something that doesn't just satisfy this A to B to C distinct relationship, it would reason to believe that that would ultimately influence C, which is, which is muscle growth. Right. And we do have some research within individuals. Um, there's a paper from Hammerstrom, uh, from 2019, the volume one, 
yeah, it's it's a it's a basically a uh, within subjects volume study. Um, very very well done study, and basically some folks responded better to to lower training volumes, some responded better to to higher training volumes, and they were able to kind of pinpoint ribosomal biogenesis as a potential modifying factor there. And again, I'm I'm cringing a little bit because there's a lot that goes into uh, exactly how to make those determinations on the individual level. But these things have been elucidated to some degree beyond like, like on an actual cellular level um, beyond just, again, those, I think those obvious ones that, that will really resonate with folks like nutritional status and, and, and steroid use. Yeah. I, I think that's a really good segue as well, because I, I suspect a lot of people were listening to what I was saying. And it's like, well, we're, we're, we're talking about training stimuli here. Like ultimately we're talking about a very like tension focused hypertrophy model. And you're talking about nutrition, you're talking about insects, like, um, you know, all, all of that stuff could influence hypertrophy, but it wouldn't necessarily mean that tension wasn't like the only exercise related stimulus that, that mattered here. Um, but I, the, the point I was trying to make with that is just that given how many like non tension factors don't initiate that hypertrophy signaling cascade, but influence the outcome of it. Um, and like, so you have that and, and also just, just how many like cellular perturbations are induced by resistance exercise. Um, like given those two facts, like I really, I really struggle to understand how someone could just boil all of this down to tension, even if they were to accept that tension was the sole initiator of hypertrophy signaling, just because like so many other things influence all other parts of the multiple hypertrophy signaling cascades. Um, and influence or regulate the cellular environment that the muscle fiber uh, being exposed to tension is experiencing. Um, that uh, like the, the analogy Zach gave of the box where you have the stimulus into the box, what's going on in the box, who knows, what's coming into and out of the box to influence everything going on in, in the box, a lot of shit. And then out the other side of the box comes an outcome that hopefully being muscle protein synthesis. Um, just given how many other regulators there are and given just how much stuff exercise does to a muscle fiber, it seems to me uh, unbelievably unlikely that other like exercise related stimuli wouldn't influence uh, like like heavily influence those signaling cascades and ultimately the outcome you're dealing with even if one were to accept that tension were the sole initiator of that cascade. Um, so like, just, just for instance, um, like the, using the two, the two, uh, like classically discarded, uh, mechanisms of hypertrophy that, that everyone shits on these days, uh, metabolic stress and muscle damage. Um, so like, I, think it's entirely likely that there isn't any specific metabolite that directly initiates hypertrophy signaling. Like, I, I think that that seems like incredibly plausible, but I wouldn't necessarily be so confident that those metabolites generated wouldn't, for instance, uh, be a stimulus for increased capillary density or mitochondrial biogenesis, um, or just like affect kind of like the general bioenergetic status of the cell, which could then like influence mTOR regulation. Um, and, and all of those things that they themselves, like the, the, uh, the change in chemical state brought on by those metabolites or the change in like the state of the muscle, be that cap increases in capillary density, mitochondrial biogenesis, uh, et cetera, like those things could um, like pretty significantly influence the hypertrophy you achieve, even if none of those, um, metabolites are directly initiating that process. Like, like if one were to fully rule out quote unquote metabolic stress as an initiator of hypertrophy, that still doesn't come anywhere close to establishing that it is not still an important modulating factor that 
strongly influences how much hypertrophy you actually achieve. Um, and similar with muscle damage, like kind of the flip side of NSAIDs, <laughs> um, you know, that's, that's going to uh, increase redox signaling, that's going to increase inflammatory status, like if you damage a muscle. Um, and if from like a separate line of research, we have evidence suggesting that uh, if um, kind of local inflammatory state is either like too inflamed or too non-inflamed, that that could positively or negatively influence the hypertrophy that one achieves. It doesn't seem unlikely to me that changes in local inflammatory status uh, brought on by local muscle damage could have a similar effect. So again, like even if there's no like direct sensor of muscle damage that kicks off that hypertrophy signaling cascade, that, that again, still doesn't get you particularly close to ruling out some sort of damage related factor as a contributor to hypertrophy that one could achieve. Um, so yeah, like I think, <laughs> I think one of my, my biggest issues with this idea that I like to term tension reductionism is that it it does, I think to me, reveal a stunning level of unawareness of just how many open research questions there still are in this area and like a pretty alarming degree of incuriosity or at least a degree of incuriosity that I would interpret as alarming. <laughs> um, so like the, the papers you guys have recommended, I would strongly recommend as well. They're, they're some of my favorites. Um, another one that I that I toss out there, um, another uh, another Auburn paper. Um, shout out to Mike Roberts uh, is mechanisms of mechanical overload induced skeletal muscle hypertrophy, current understandings and future directions. Um, it is an absolute monster. I don't. I think it might still just be preprinted. I don't know if it's been published yet. Um, but like the the preprint version is like 126 pages, and it has almost a thousand sources. I think it has like 991. And honestly, uh, Dr. Roberts, if you're listening to this, like generally it's not good, uh, good form to just like add in extra references to like pad your reference list. But like, if you're that close to a thousand, like just do it, you know? Um, no one will notice. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's an excellent paper. And, um, you know, a, a, a lot of, a lot of the heavy hitters in kind of like mechanisms of hypertrophy research, like the not, not, not jabronis like us who are talking about it on the podcast, me being a much larger jabroni than you guys, because you're, you're still actively involved in research, but like the folks who are actually like doing studies and taking biopsies and, and, uh, you know, innovating new research techniques to like study and understand this stuff better. Um, like, a pretty good chunk of those folks were authors on this paper and like here is their conclusion and so uh you you eh, j j just compare this to some of the more confident statements about causes of hypertrophy that you might encounter on the internet uh okay so quoting from the paper a central tenet of this review is that several mechanisms are required for mechanical overload induced skeletal muscle hypertrophy as shown in the summary table below and much remains to be learned in these areas as well. Skeletal muscle hypertrophy research has rapidly evolved since the landmark report by Merpurgo in 1897. Pioneering discoveries in the field have motivated others to adopt innovative methodologies and drive the research boundaries in meaningful ways. Given the rapid advancements in molecular-based research techniques, investigations in upcoming years will continue to con confirm or refute which of the discussed mechanisms are obligatory for, rather than coinciding with, load-induced skeletal muscle hypertrophy. More importantly, these efforts will likely unveil novel mechanisms that continue to reshape our thinking in this area of muscle biology. So, you know, I, I would strongly recommend you read the whole paper so you would know what those, like, other mechanisms they refer to are. But, um, like, that's how they wrap it up. And the folks researching this stuff clearly believe that there are still way more questions than answers. And uh, I think that if a non-expert in the area feels otherwise, there's a pretty decent chance that they're wrong. 
kind of. <laughs> so yeah. Um, yeah. Look, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to cut you off, but I think this might be. It, it's important to take a step back and kind of mention that, like the the soft version uh, of effective reps. So, so just to to make sure the listeners on the same page that reps closer to failure are in isolation, probably a little bit more hypertrophic than reps further from failure. Um, we aren't saying that that is is untrue, and 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 in fact, the the regressions would. Uh, would support that. But I think, Greg, kind of where, where you're coming from is that is a, well, not not completely obvious, but at least sort of obvious statement. Yeah. Um, we, we, yeah. So, but the, I think where we're taking issue or where we would at least have a different perspective is, is twofold. The first is that there is a clear distinction between a repetition that is is fully or even partly effective um, in terms of it kind of being in, in on or off switch. And then secondly, as, as Greg, you kind of termed this, this tension reductionism kind of viewpoint in terms of we are optimizing for this input, right? If you mm -hmm. optimize for the input, as opposed to, to the output, you can be led astray. Right. And we, we've, we've seen this kind of historically, right. In terms of optimizing for things like maximizing EMG values, maximizing for acute muscle protein synthesis maximizing for other mechanisms that we kind of assumed drove the hypertrophy stimulus things. Maximizing like. for time under tension, do, doing some 30-second yeah, yeah, yeah. reps. Growth hormone. Exactly. Hell yeah. Exactly. And nope. the the mechanistic stuff, I think, is, is the most interesting when you can uh, kind of overlay it with longitudinal outcomes. And that's why I like a lot of the stuff that, that Auburn does, is, as we've mentioned a few times because they, they will try to draw some of those, those relationships, right? The, the paper mm -hmm. from Hammerstrom also looks to draw some of those relationships. And then, okay, once you see kind of this, this pattern in the research using, using the, the meta regression here, right? We can look at solely mechanistic papers with, without actual applied outcomes and back calculate or, or generate hypotheses regarding uh, a, a mental model that could apply to some degree but we've been off before and i don't think there has been a a dramatic shift in terms of our understanding of muscle physiology to assume that we have all the answers now um but i do think uh not to uh to toot our own horn too much i do think this paper is an important step in terms of understanding one of the potential training variables that is going to have a relatively reliable uh, relationship with, with the actual applied outcome of interest of, of increasing muscle size. Um, what other things from a, from a training perspective? And, and when I say training perspective, this could also be like a potential mechanism that could be applied through training, right. Or, or, um, a, a concept that could be applied through training. Do you, do you guys think might be a play? Um, we we've kind of, again, established that. Yeah. If, if you have higher, uh, per fiber tension or, or per fiber force, it's probably going to be a good thing for hypertrophy. But as we we've said, we're skeptical of that being the, the only thing. So what other things would you guys throw into the mix that would at least to some degree, uh, kind of align with the, the applied outcomes we have? Not to, not to take us too far off, um, off course here, but I'm curious to get Greg, curious to get your feedback on this idea because this is something I've had rattling around in my head for a while. You mentioned you mentioned the muscle damage thing, um, and I don't I don't tend to completely disagree with the way that's usually discussed. But I have a really weird feeling in my stomach when I pretty much entirely I think there's one study that people refer to to basically entirely refute the possibility that muscle damage is even remotely. Um, at play with hypertrophy. And to be clear, the Damas study that people refer to is a really, really good study. Um, and I think it does a really good job at maybe, um, you know, talking about the the regulation or, or the initiation process of muscle damage and things like that. But I've always, I've always wondered that potentially muscle damage is kind of this, um, this variable that kind of goes in waves 
So initially, you know, prior to the repeated bout effect kind of occurring um, to a large extent, muscle damage is going to be high to any, um, you know, given bout of, of resistance training, right? And the way that the narrative is kind of painted in response to this Damas article is that the upregulations and muscle protein synthesis are going to be initially dedicated towards repairing that muscle damage. And then once that has subsided, the remaining muscle protein synthesis is going to lead to positive protein accretion. To me, that just says that in that initial bout, that's kind of the time course that happens. But I don't see how like later down the line that that process couldn't be upregulated again if you reintroduce a bout of muscle damage. And so I just think about, you know, the kind of the quote unquote resensitization effect or, or different things that people kind of have noticed in practice and kind of the sprinkling in the research, the muscle memory effect that you've noticed uh, or the, that you've mentioned already. Like, I don't know, I, I'm personally not totally comfortable completely writing off muscle damage as like one thing that I think out of the candidate original mechanisms, I think people tend to throw that one out first. And then the, um, the metabolic stress has a little bit more of people that are remaining, uh, to hold on to that. But I don't know how to get your guys's initial thoughts on that. And tell me if I'm wrong, if, if the, the case in terms of the primary argument with that goes, but to me, I've always thought of it as like, yeah, like you're not going to optimize a program for muscle damage, but at least in theory to me, like it could start this kind of positive wave initially. And then once you've adapted to a stimulus such that you can basically not increase muscle damage at all, maybe that's where some of these kind of resensitization effects at least partially play a role, but I'm, I could be off base. What do you guys think? Damn. Are, are people citing Damas as the main, the main evidence against that these days? I think, uh, I think Flan from 2011 is much stronger. Okay. Um, it's, uh, ah, whatever. It doesn't matter. But, um, <laughs> Uh, I, it, it irks me when there's a strong citation for something and people opt for the weak one. Um, but yeah, like, I, I think that, um, I think that, that it's probably relatively context dependent. Um, and I suspect that, that if damage does play a role, um, it is probably a kind of like, uh, uh, hormesis type relationship where like if like too little might be bad too much might be bad and in the case of untrained lifters they're experiencing way way more muscle damage than trained lifters would in the course of normal training um and so yeah like i i think it's i think it's entirely likely that the like extremely extremely significant muscle damage that people um, experience during their first session or two, I think it's entirely likely that that is non-productive or potentially even counterproductive for hypertrophy, but that doesn't come anywhere particularly close to ruling out, um, kind of like some lesser degree of muscle damage and kind of the, the, insub the subsequent inflammatory, uh, cascade resulting from it as potentially being productive. Um, but yeah, like I'm, I'm, I'm open to it, but I'm also not like super confident in it. Uh, j just to get a little nutty, like I do think I'm, I'm still like a big, I'm a big metabolic stress truther, um, and I, I think that that probably Get like, your ten hats on, folks. Here we go. Uh, I, I think, I think that relates to, um, I think that relates to just like training volume as well, because like ultimately, um. Like you're you you are generating less tension each set, um, and so like if there were kind of like a threshold of tension that needed to be achieved, um, if it were at all challenging to reach that threshold in the first set, it would be like increasingly challenging to reach it in subsequent sets. Um, but yeah, like I I, th I think that I honestly think that there is something to. Um, uh, something related to metabolic stress. Um, and I, I think that there's an interplay with volume there. Um, and, and a lot of that stems from something that like keeps me up at night, which is like, why do muscles stop growing in the first place? Cause like that, that is like an insane thing that we don't have an answer to that question yet because, and, and it's, it's also like another example of kind of the breakdown between acute and chronic findings because, 
when you just look at like muscle protein synthesis and muscle protein breakdown rates in trained lifters, um, it doesn't look like people are in like a super net catabolic state that they have to like train really, really hard just to like keep themselves from atrophying. And when they do a resistance training workout and they measure um, muscle protein synthesis, you don't see as large or as sustained of a muscle protein synthetic response as you do in untrained lifters, but you still see like a pretty robust elevation in muscle protein synthesis that lasts for at least like 12 to 24 hours. And so you look at, at that kind of like acute cellular data and it would suggest that like you should still be able to keep growing like pretty well basically forever. Um, but that's not what you see. And I think that it's a, a fascinating uh, thing to think about why. And so here, here's kind of my, my nutty idea. I think a lot of it has to do with just basic bioenergetics. And, and this is this is why I think volume is important and why I'm like a metabolic stress truther. Um, so ultimately, uh, people don't think about the spatial relationship of stuff within a muscle fiber, but I think they should because I think it's very interesting and I think it's very instructive. Most of the stuff in a muscle fiber is near the sarcolemma. Like it's near the, uh, the, 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 cell membrane of the muscle fiber. Um, as you get further and further into the fiber, um, you know, you'll still come across like some, some granules of glycogen and you'll still come across, um, plenty of, uh, plenty of actual like contractile proteins, but the mitochondria and the ribosomes and like, I mean, the, the nuclei are just like, just, just right there. Sub sub sarcolimal. Um, like most, most of these stuff, except for contractile proteins is just crowded around the, the borders of the fiber. Um, cause that, that's where like most of the stuff is going to happen. And that's probably a, a primary place where like tension is sensed in the first place. Um, like one, one of the main candidates for a tension sensor is some sort of like costumer associated protein. Um, like, uh, a protein that, that helps kind of like hook the muscle fiber onto the connective tissue matrix surrounding it. Um, and so, yeah, that's also where like gas exchange is taking place. That's where you're getting rid of waste products. You're getting a new energetic substrate, getting a new amino acids. Um, and I mean, like ultimately, like if, if uh, you're going to like build a new protein, like that starts by transcribing mRNA like from the nucleus, which is just like right there, just like, just right subsarcolimal. And so like everything is crowded around the outside of a cell. And I think a lot of that has to do with like bioenergetic regulation, because one of the things you see in like all cell types, like this is, this is like only a Sith speaks in absolutes, but like I'm going to here. Um, like surface area to volume ratios, uh, like constraining cell growth is like a universal fact of biology. Like you, you see it literally everywhere. Um, cause like essentially the, the stuff, the stuff inside a cell is, is what is doing stuff and like what is expending energy, what needs resources. Um, but like in the case of a eukaryotic cell where you, where you get rid of waste products and where you get new stuff, um, whether that be oxygen or carbohydrate or amino acids or signaling molecules or whatever, um, is from the surface area of the cell. Like it's, it's diffusing in from capillaries. Um, and so like, I think that there is, I, I think that there are just like basic bioenergetic constraints that, um, like limit cell growth. And so like, this is, this is like maybe like kind of a nihilistic perspective, but I, I sort of think that for like a given level of like local aerobic capacity, uh, when you're talking about what training variables matter, I think you're mostly just talking about how quickly you're going to bump up against the limit of how large your muscle cells can get, uh, at a given like level of, of bioenergetic capacity. And then I think that to continue growing, like for a muscle cell to continue growing, um, 
it is going to come down a lot to kind of like local aerobic and anaerobic conditioning because like that's going to increase the ceiling um, on just like how much bioenergetic flux a muscle cell can comfortably handle um, and kind of like, you know, kind of give itself permission to grow more. It's like, okay, we're this big and we're, we're not going to grow anymore because like when this person exercises hard, we, we are getting like kind of close to a bioenergetic crisis. And like, that's not good. We don't want to do that. We'll have to do apoptosis. No, like we're, we're not doing that shit. We're not growing anymore. And then kind of like local, uh, local conditioning improves. And it's like, oh, hey, when this person exercises hard now, like yeah, it's still kind of uncomfortable, but it's not threatening a bioenergetic crisis. So now let's kind of like take our foot off the brake a little bit and let this muscle grow a little bit larger. Um, I don't know. I, I think I think that's kind of what's happening. Um, and like in instances where you use some sort of like perturbation to let muscle fibers grow larger than they otherwise would, um, they do tend to not seem to be doing particularly well. So like in in like myostatin mutant mice that wind up with like super, super big muscle fibers, um, they're like pretty weak per unit of cross-sectional area. Um, and like essentially the mice look really impressive, but they're not great athletes because the muscles have grown larger than they can be useful. And so there's kind of that, that trade-off with them. Um, there's some evidence that like steroids might be similar where kind of like the, the uh, force production per unit of cross-sectional area might be a little bit lower. Um, there might be some like increases in local inflammation, perhaps due to redox signaling, perhaps due to the cells getting too large to do as much aerobic metabolism as they would like to do. And just kind of like, again, some, some just kind of like bioenergetic breakdowns. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I do, I do think that that's quite important. I, I think that if you're not particularly close to your limits of hypertrophy, I think that it's essentially irrelevant and yeah, yeah. Just expose the fibers to some tension. They'll grow just fine, whatever. Um, and I think to keep growing past a certain point, and I, I think this is why like volume and not just having attention stimulus, because because like th that's another thing with proximity to failure that that should be discussed. Um, like you could look at it through the lens of you go closer to failure and that's increasing per fiber tension. And like that is why you see increased growth. But all else being equal, I mean, if you do a set of 10 uh, with a 10 rep max load, you're also doing two more reps than you would if you would have done a set of seven. And so that is going to increase kind of the local metabolic stress. It's probably going to increase muscle damage a little bit as well. Kind of like it, it's, it's challenging to, even in that context to say that if you're seeing more growth, that tension is the driver because like every other purported mechanism of, of hypertrophy would also be higher going closer to failure rather than stopping further from failure. Um, but yeah, like I, I think that that's maybe one of the things contributing to increased growth when training closer to failure. I think that's one of the, probably one of the things contributing to increased growth um, with, with higher training volumes as well. One of the things that, that is, I think like kind of striking, I guess, is that, um, one of the studies, oh man, I'm blanking on the author. It was a Brazilian study, but in, in the, in the volume literature, um, the, I think the strongest result in favor of, uh, like higher training volumes, even with, like with short rest intervals and all of that, um, leading to more growth is like far and away the longest study on, on training volume, at least in like healthy subjects that's been done. It was like a six month paper and the Radioli um, or no? Do what? Radioli. Is that the one you're talking about? Yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, like you you tend to see, uh, like maybe, maybe small, often non-significant differences in hypertrophy with higher training volumes, like in most of the research in the area, but like, in that one study, short rest intervals, super high training volumes, high volume 
seemed to be very good. Um, and so, you know, it, it could just be that like, <laughs> you, you need kind of a longer runtime in a study for folks to maybe have like constraints on hypertrophy that higher levels of volume and more metabolic stress would help kind of alleviate and, and let them continue growing. Like, I don't know. I, I don't want to over extrapolate from one study, but just kind of like yeah. noodling a little bit. That's, that's kind of my, my view of hypertrophy. I think, I think that ultimately the, the interesting question isn't necessarily what, will help you grow faster because like if if you're a natty and you're and you're you're doing well for yourself and you're training right and all of that like mm, shit's gonna get pretty like you're you're gonna get to pretty tough sledding after probably five or six years um and if you're not training that well or that smart yeah maybe it's gonna take you a decade but like you i think you kind of get to the same place regardless sure and so the the question turns to like, well, how how do we keep things going after that? And I, I really do I really do think like metabolic factors and like local bioenergetic factors, um, it, at least for me, are, are kind of like the prime candidate uh, for things serving as that constraint on further growth. And I I would I would like to see more more research on that. So I mean I think the the nugget there, from from like in reference to the primary conversation is we just outline two pretty plausible additional components to this equation that can very, you know, plausibly play a role um, in addition to the kind of the primary tension initiating kind of rabbit hole we discussed there. So I think, yeah, <laughs> in addition to the, the conclusion you read from the Roberts paper, those are two, you know, primarily drawing on the longitudinal evidence there, two very plausible additional cases that could modify hypertrophy from the longitudinal literature that, you know, are outside of the, the tension, the tension, you know, primary rabbit hole there. Um, and, and just underlines how, how much we have to go in terms of understanding this and being able to predict outcomes at a, you know, a perfect level, which I think sometimes it's communicated, um, like we can do that, but Josh, I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah, we have, uh, an analysis planned basically be able to compare the dose response relationship between training volume and, and hypertrophic outcomes with, with different rest periods. So mm. like say less than 90 second rest or less than two minute rest or greater than that. Um, and I, if, if I'm picking up what you're putting down, Greg, basically your point is that with shorter rest periods, if, so let me take a step back. If tension is, is the only thing that matters, um, with shorter rest periods, you would expect to see less of a dose response relationship. Is that accurate? Or a, a less convincing dose response relationship? Um, but, but between what two factors? Between volume and hypertrophy or mm -hmm. what? Yeah. Um, yeah, hmm. volume and hypertrophy given the, the rest interval conditions is what yeah. you're talking about, right? So because because you would get less and less uh, yeah, you would get um, metabolic stress might become the kind of the limiter, if you will, um, for those later sets later in the session. And and I'm thinking about this uh, right now as 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 we speak. So I might be missing something. Yeah, p potentially. I mean, I I hmm, I could see I could see in that context the productive stimulus changing over the course of a workout where um you know maybe ah, like th this is this is like hopelessly reductive but whatever maybe with like long rest intervals you you can do like five productive sets like you're recovering well and tension's high enough like whatever with shorter rest intervals, maybe only like the first three are productive because you're accumulating fatigue faster. You can't generate as much tension, blah, 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 whatever. But then if you're doing like 12 of those sets, yeah, like maybe only the first three were kind of like directly relevant for attention stimulus. But then like once you've done enough of them, it's now kind of like transitioned into being an, an aerobic stimulus that could stimulate further like mitochondrial uh, uh, biogenesis, greater capillary density, um, you know, 
et cetera. And so, yeah, like I, I, I wonder if like the, the, what, what is constituting the productive stimulus there would, would even be the same, like from the start of the workout to the end of it. Yeah. It's, it's tricky. And this is why it's so difficult to, uh, make these logical conclusions using applied research is because just, just kind of thinking about it right now, I think the, the variables that would drive metabolic stress would be proximity to failure, which also contributes to per fiber, per fiber mechanical tension, uh, training volume, as you noted, Greg, which also would kind of have an additive effect in terms of tension. And then I also think lower loads would contribute to higher metabolic stress. Um, but per fiber of mechanical tension is speculated to be kind of similar near the end of a set, no matter what load is used. So the things that are going to contribute to metabolic stress are also going to kind of contribute to uh, per fiber mechanical tension in an applied setting. There are some nifty research designs in an applied sense to get some insights outside of that. And there is a, a pre-printed meta-analysis comparing blood flow restriction training to traditional training. And they basically broke it into uh, like two separate analyses. So a common protocol in the research with BFR is using the same load, you go 30 reps, rest like 30 to 60 seconds, 15 reps, rest 30 to 60 seconds, 15 reps again, 30 to 60 seconds, 15 reps again. So 30, 15, 15, 15. So mm -hmm. they did analysis comparing traditional training to that 30, 15, 15, 15 sort of approach. And then they also did a separate analysis comparing traditional training to BFR training with that, that went to failure. Right. Mm -hmm. And basically what you see is that, um, in each of those separate analyses, right, there was no difference between the, the training approaches, right? So in other words, BFR training seems to be similar in effectiveness to traditional training, regardless of clear control of, of proximity to failure. Now we've seen proximity to failure, not really play out in kind of a traditional meta-analysis before. So I don't want to over index on that, but it does make me wonder if with BFR training, we, we, we think we know that, uh, sort of the acceleration of fatigue, if you will, can contribute to per fiber mechanical tension, but given that kind of small hint there that perhaps that's not the only thing going on with something like blood flow restriction. I've also, I'm also aware of at least one study, um, where simply using BFR cup, uh, BFR cuffs in the absence of, of any contractions, if, if, if I'm recalling correctly, was able to at least attenuate atrophy compared to the alternative mm -hmm. of, of, you know, uh, no BFR at all and no contractions. Um, which, which makes me wonder if there is kind of this, uh, this, this independent role, um, but again, it's really hard to separate in these applied mm -hmm. outcome studies. And then the, the last thing to layer on there is like, okay, even if it is, is that additive, right? Or mm -hmm. would that just be redundant in terms of ultimately, you know, to kind of use our, our oversimplified model, is that ultimately uh, additive or redundant in terms of driving up B and driving up C in terms of that, that the, process of muscle growth? The one, the one additional area that honestly was, I would say I was maybe 80, 20 in the camp of kind of the tension is from the practical perspective is ultimately one of the only things that matter before your initial, um, effective reps article. But then the couple studies that you pulled out that at least brought me back to reality and kind of opened my mind to be pretty agnostic on it was the, the few studies that use that additional set of like 20% of one RM. Oh yeah, yeah. Those are really, really interesting. Um, and so just to kind of to line it up for the, the reader on kind of how that line of reasoning works is that, so this isn't super well researched in terms of the bottom cutoff of kind of the loading spectrum that we can expect hypertrophy from, but there's one decent study that finds that 20% of one RM, even when taken to what I'm going to call task failure is insufficient to produce, you know, meaningful hypertrophy. And so at the end of uh, Greg's effective reps article, he cites a few of these studies that basically perform the exact same training program, but they add in these, you know, metabolic stress sets, um, that 
take t- approximately 20% of one RM and, and take like one set to failure. Um, I think in one study, it might be a little bit more than one set. Um, so obvious limitation, they're not set equated in that instance, but based on that other research, we wouldn't expect that to elicit an independent tensile effect because, you know, on its own, it doesn't seem to produce hypertrophy necessarily. Um, but when in combination that seems to actually improve hypertrophy compared to the condition of only doing, you know, traditional type training. Um, the only other caveat there is that I believe in at least one of the ones that you cited that they performed the, the kind of the fatigue set before, um, all of the training that, and I believe the way that the training was prescribed, it didn't control proximity to failure. So conceivably, you know, one really fatiguing set could kind of influence the proximity to failure of all the other training that comes after it, but mm-hmm. at least one of them, it was after. And so yeah, that, the, me, the that study. Yeah, one of them. One of them, the fatigue set was was after, and that to me is a pretty interesting case um, for kind of the the additive effects of, of the kind of the metabolic stress kind of oriented um, type thinking. So I, I don't know if you have any additional commentary on that, but I, I always thought that was at least, like I said, kind of brought me back to reality to remain agnostic on the topic to say like, all right, this isn't perfectly predicted by kind of the way that we think about things. So I'm I'm gonna, you know not be as confident about this ultimately. Yeah, that that's uh the, that that's a pair of studies that have been rattling around in my head a little bit. Um the the other ones that that come to mind are the the research out of Japan, the tricep study I think by Agasawara would be the most well known, but um uh looking at like the relationship between like oxyhemoglobin desaturation and hypertrophy with uh, the the tricep study was like full range of motion versus kind of like, so so 120 degrees of elbow flexion to zero degrees of elbow flexion versus uh, 90 to 45 degrees of elbow flexion. So like if you're, if you're a full range of motion guy, you should think full range of motion would do better. If you're a long muscle length guy, you would think that full range of motion would do better because you're you're going all the way down to 120 degrees of flexion. But they saw more triceps growth with just the 90 to 45. Um, and they found a uh, not like super strong, but decent relationship between observed hypertrophy and uh, observed like hemoglobin desaturation uh, during training. So as I guess, kind of like a proxy for metabolic stress or whatever. Um, so yeah, like that's, that's always been in the back of my mind. I don't know. I mean, ultimately, ultimately my, my takeaway is that like, I don't have any firm answers. And I think that like, if some of these things contribute, it's just kind of a question of like, how much and for whom, and like, in what contexts, like, like, for instance, I, I, so, uh, like, like let, let's use, let's use metabolic stress as an example. Like there, there are two potential ways maybe that it could contribute to hypertrophy. It could be that it is causing, um, adaptate, like it is also longitudinally causing other adaptations that they themselves influence the hypertrophy response. So like in this model, the metabolic stress you experience during training has no effect on the actual like muscle protein synthetic response you get from training, but um, the metabolic stress that you generate causes an increase in mitochondrial density and increase in capillary density longitudinally. And as you like, as you accrue those longitudinal adaptations, it is those adaptations that then might make uh, like might help kind of like amplify and help you get better results from a similar tension stimulus down the road. Another potential uh, option is that it could be kind of influencing, um, you know, inter- intermediate steps of the hypertrophy signaling cascade. Like you kick off the cascade with a tension stimulus, and then in kind of like the the pre or post mTOR stage of that signaling cascade, something related to metabolic stress. I don't know, maybe just like helps increase the efficiency of creating splice variants of IGF-1. So you get more mechano growth factor uh, going on uh, 
than you would have if you had like less metabolic stress and that uh, even with the same tension stimulus leads to like greater um, gene transcription and, and more muscle protein accrual. Like those, those would have like very different um, like broad applications. Um, cause, Cause like, for instance, if you were training a, um, an endurance athlete and they wanted to do some resistance training, like put some muscle on, like help, um, help like reduce injury risk or whatever. If it's the first one that like, you know, the metabolic stimulus increases mitochondrial density and capillary density. And that is how it has a like permissive role for increasing hypertrophy. You wouldn't need to think about that at all for the endurance athlete. You would just say like, no, we're just doing tension stimulus for you because you already have great mitochondrial density and capillary density. If it were the latter, then you'd say, oh, like this would probably still be productive for you. You know, um, like you, you generate the tension and then via this metabolic stress, we create the cellular environment that would help amplify the signal in initiated by that tension stimulus. Um, and yeah, like either of those could be true. Both of them could be bullshit. Uh, only one or the other could be true. Who knows? Like... Uh, theme of this episode, a lot of open questions. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, it, it could also just be that, like, some things require kind of, like, specific tailored training approaches and some don't. Um, or or there might just be, like, more efficient ways to train. So, like, the, the example of a lower load set um, before or after your heavy training. Let's just say... Like, I, I don't know if this is true, but like, let's just assume that the benefits of training volume are entirely due to the fact that they increase the metabolic stress you experience during a training session. Like, I, I don't think that's true, but like, let's just assume that. If that were the case, then like, ah, maybe you generate enough tension during, during your first like two or three sets. And then you have two options. You could either do five more sets of 10 to ramp your volume enough up enough to like increase metabolic stress enough to, to positively influence those downstream signaling cascade things. Or you could just do like one set of 20% of one RM to failure. Um, and, and that would cause like a similar metabolic stimulus and therefore lead to the same outcomes. You know, um, th then that gives you options. Like if someone would rather go heavy, it's like, oh, cool. Like we'll just do more sets. Someone is kind of a masochist and wants to do a set of 40 and hate their fucking life. Cool. Like, we'll just do the one hard set. Uh, if someone is interested in like time efficiency, it's like, oh, well, we're definitely just going to do the, the one lower load set. You know, like it, it would it would give options and kind of like help. Help you better understand if, if things things you're doing could be accomplished more efficiently or. Um, you know, if, if things overlap enough that they become redundant. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and perhaps the worst part of perspective is it might depend on unique physiological factors, perhaps related to previous training history or other things that aren't even on my radar. I think to the, the rest period research, um, there are at least a couple studies that lean in favor of, of shorter rests. Um, but if I, if I'm recalling correctly right now, uh, they were both in kind of unique populations. So one of them was in, uh, untrained older adults. And then one of them, I think it was, was one of the Fink studies, uh, was in like 18 year olds or something like that, which yeah. I don't think had like, uh, distinct resistance training history perhaps and and maybe just a result of their their age as well didn't have some of those uh those adaptations that could be uh those those local metabolic adaptations just to kind of use broad brushstrokes mm -hmm. here um so so maybe it becomes completely irrelevant when you establish a baseline of that and, and it's uh, no longer productive, or maybe it's something that has kind of a, a short-term effect. Some of the BFR studies that kind of have like eye-popping hypertrophy from, uh, you know, dropping in a, a couple weeks of, of low load blood flow restriction training kind of come to mind there as well. Mm -hmm. 
so there's there's additional questions that once you get to the point of or if you get to the point of whether this is something that has any merit at all right of, of kind of combining these different mechanisms uh is like okay now for who right and when mm -hmm. and 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 that would probably be a whole nother step in and of itself um let alone the complexities of of actual actually establishing some of the the predictors we might want um in terms of determining who who it would be useful for um yeah yeah one of the um what one of the studies published in recent years that that i have personally really liked was um oh uh published last year uh Carniero was the author, um, different load intensity transition schemes to avoid plateau and no response and lean body mass gain in postmenopausal women. Um, I, I think it's, I think this paper was, was a good example of that because like the subjects in this study, one, they kind of served as their own control, although not temporally, um, like it wasn't a within subject unilateral design, but it, it was a crossover paper. So um, basically they did one, uh, one, like one approach to training for three months and then switched over and did another one. And, uh, another group of people did the same two approaches to training, but in the opposite order. And it was kind of like a classic moderate load versus low load study. So training with, uh, like eight to 12 RM loads versus 27 to 31. Don't know why they went for 27 to 31 instead of 25 to 30, but whatever. I didn't design the study. I don't make the rules. Um, and yeah, like the the kind of high level, like group level results were in keeping with what one would expect from moderate load versus low load studies. Like uh, on average, the uh, the hypertrophy was similar following both approaches to training. Um, well, I shouldn't say hypertrophy. Gains in lower body lean soft tissue mass, which whatever, hopefully that's close enough. Um, but then like they also reported individual data, which um, like I, I, I understand, you know, issues of like measurement accuracy and regression to the mean and all of that. Like you can't necessarily assume that observed variation is actual variation, like blah, 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 I get it. But also... I mean, some of the some of the intra individual differences observed in responses, like in response to these two approaches to training, were were large enough in magnitude that I like absolutely think that at least for some of the subjects that they were sure. like quite real. Sure. So, like, just for one example, um, like one of the subjects had a five percent reduction in lean soft tissue mass following moderate load training and a 10% increase with low load training. And like another one uh, kind of on the opposite had a 13% increase following moderate load training and only a 3% increase with low load training, like, like big enough differences in responses that for sure, I think it's pretty suggestive of like in actual, like legitimate intra individual difference in responses to those different training stimuli, which if you looked at it through an effective reps lens, you'd say, oh no, like they're training to failure. Like both, um, both, uh, intensities would have had the same number of effective reps per set. Uh, everyone should have experienced the same hypertrophy with both moderate and low load training. Um, and like, you do see that on a group level, but if that was your takeaway, you're like, oh, like it, it really doesn't matter either in general or for you specifically. Like that would be pretty bad advice to a non-trivial number of those subjects. Sure. Um, so yeah, like I, I think I, I think that there there are like plenty of suggestions that there like the optimal approach to training can probably vary quite a bit person to person. Um, and like a, another another thing that you guys have alluded to um, several times is like it might even vary within an individual over time. Like I. I'm like kind of, I'm also like kind of a novelty truther. Um, <laughs> uh oh, here we go. Josh is perked up. Here we go. Are, are you, are you pro or anti pro. novelty? Hell pro. yeah. Hell yeah. My man. Do we not, do we not just grow for four weeks? Like every, every two years? <laughs> no. Yes. Dude. Like the, the, like I, I, I have like this, this little cycle that I run from time to time that, um, 
like it's it's like the dumbest thing. Like I I start with my ten rep max squat and uh, just like go go up and wait every week um, and try not to lose reps and like it, for six weeks it always just fucking works. Like my leg <laughs> my legs blow up, my squat goes up, it's great, and then it just stops working. And like if I immediately go back to my 10 rep max and start building up again, just doesn't work. Like it never works twice, but it always works once. <laughs> um, and it's, and it's not just because like I'm starting out bad in that rep range. Like e even if I'm like pretty conditioned going into it, uh, if, if I, if I'm doing that following like a lower rep training block, like it always works. Um, and then it just like stops working. But then if I do go back to, to lower rep training, even if, um, you know, e even if like due to lack of specific or like even even if my performance hasn't gone down, like lower rep training does become just like more effective again uh, after after doing that block. Like, yeah, I I think there's something there. Honestly, that's, that's kind of the grounds that I've always, I, you know, I call it muscle damage. To me, it's mostly just like that's a proxy of novelty because, you know, the more custom you get to a stimulus, typically the less muscle damage you get. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's, that's kind of the, always the way that I've thought about it is like the, there seems to be a shelf life for a given organization of training variables mm -hmm. such that once you get adapted enough to it, that, you know, it, it kind of seems like it's run its course. And then, you know, people that, you know, run their head into the wall with the same organization of training variables for a really long time. Um, and they don't make progress for, like you said, Josh, for like two years. And then they, you know, try a substantial shift in 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 something then maybe that those productive mechanisms to certain things that they've accustomed themselves to you know you come back to hitting some 15s on front squat and now your adductors are screaming at you um certain things like that like that's always kind of been my experience too is like you deviate from what you've held on to really tightly and then in the long run that kind of seems to pay off and and that's that's always what i've kind of like spitballed in the back of my head with the uh the muscle damage thing is that's like, it's starting another kind of round of productive, mm -hmm, um, yeah. you know, because MPS, for example, is highest when you're getting contributions from both the recovery of damage, but also the accretion of theoretically new tissue. Right. So maybe that's a positive thing initially until you kind of let that damage subside, you have like a positive adaptation window for a while and then it goes away again. Cause now you're perfectly adapted. That's kind of, you know, I don't know, something I've thrown around in my head, but I'm, I'm with you guys. I'm also a novelty enjoyer. I, I've always wondered if, um, if, if kind of like, so periodization is one of those <laughs> things where like, it, it's like so popular in the wild, but it's not that strongly supported in the research, um, per particularly for hypertrophy. And honestly, I kind of think for strength too, I think that there are some methodological issues like, the periodized groups almost without fail end up training with higher loads before testing. It's like, yeah, well, did periodization do it? Or did this group train with 90% in the three weeks before testing and the other group train with 70? Yeah, who knows? Anyway, but like, yeah, the, the research isn't that compelling, especially for hypertrophy, but it's like periodized approaches to training are still like extremely popular in practice. Um, and like, I do wonder if some of that is just kind of like market forces where if you're a coach, you can't just tell people, ah, try to add five pounds if you can forever. Cause eventually they'll be like, what, what am I paying you for? Yep. Um, but I do, I do think that it might also like partially be practical where, um, you know, maybe, maybe it's something that you wouldn't necessarily observe in a 12 week training study, but if someone were to just use the exact same approach to training for two years, they've, fully habituated to it. They're getting nothing out of it anymore. But if they're just always doing like eight week hypertrophy block, eight week strength block, eight week hypertrophy block, eight week strength block, they never get adapted enough to either one that it stops being productive. And so, you know, if you could run that theoretical two year training study, um, you, you might see something that you wouldn't necessarily observe in 12 weeks. Like I, I think that I'm, I'm extremely open to that possibility. So. Even, even from a logistical perspective, I was going to say like, you know, we're running a training study right now, which is probably the longest one that we've ever done. Um, sorry guys. Easily. Um, yeah, sorry. 
Greg, um, Greg, before you were, uh, you, you kind of waved your hand at some of the things required to establish inter-individual variation. And, uh, we're <laughs> three quarters of the way done with just a monster study. That's, it's, it's, it's next dissertation. I don't want to speak for you, but uh, I felt your pain, Zach, because it's, it's effectively doubles the work of a normal, a normal, yeah. No, so, yeah, doubles the work of a normal training study. All I was going to say with that, yeah, it's been a pain, but um, uh, <laughs> what I was going to say with that is like having these participants go for so long um, with a similar training protocol, like I could also see from a wild perspective, like the, benefits of periodization very much could be logistically driven just from the sense that performing the exact same program for you know a year like you're not you're not enjoying that training with the same vigor in the second six months of that right like it just just logistically doesn't even work so it could be a combination of both the physiology because I, I think 12-week training study, recreationally trained participants, their adaptive window to a given stimulus, particularly when the stimulus they're on in the training study is probably the most productively they've trained for a lot of these individuals, progressive overload, people loading the weights for them, uh, you know, whole, whole gamut of, you know, you this got, is... Uh, you got grad students yelling at them. To oh, it. yeah. The, the whole gamut of like, this is a luxury training environment for all intents and purposes that adaptive window to that stimulus is probably going to always surpass the duration of a training and study. Um, so the practical points of those types of interventions, whether it be novelty, whether it be periodization, things like that, once you're people like us that have trained for, you know, five to 10 years, maybe that stuff starts to become a little bit more rev relevant because your, your, your training cycle that you just talked about, you know, you get six weeks out of it, but then it hits that hard cutoff. For somebody who's just taken that for the first time, that's probably going to last them, you know, probably multiple months. Um, so that that could also be kind of a, a constraint um, operating from that end too. We've we've gotten pretty far off of uh, proximity <laughs> failure and effective reps, but um, one of the uh, one of one of like the papers that I remember when it was published, um, a lot of people had snarky things to say about it. Was uh, it was like a narrative review by Lineke from eh, maybe like 2018, 2019 um, about essentially like how long muscles grow mm, in yeah. response to resistance infinity training. And beyond or that Do what? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Infinity, yeah, infinity beyond. Yeah, that's the tag um, I remember. And like the, the basic takeaway is like it, it differed by muscle group, but, um, you know, essentially he looked at studies that assessed um, muscle size at at least three points in time, like at least pre-study, mid-study, post-study, instead of just pre and post, um, and look to see kind of like how long you could, you could kind of push out that mid-study to post-study window and still see appreciable gains from mid-study to post-study. And like for, for most muscle groups, he, his takeaway was like, yeah, it seems like muscles stop growing after about 12 weeks. Like why, why is everyone out here training for hypertrophy when you hit the gym? Like you're going to stop growing in three months anyways, which practically like I disagree with that, but also I don't think his interpretation of the research was wrong. Um, and so, yeah, like I, I absolutely think people can grow for well over three months, maybe even years. Um, but like when you when you look through his analysis, like he is kind of right that in training studies that use the same training intervention for like six months, you don't really see much growth for the last three. Um, and so, yeah, like if that is true and if in the real world we continue to see people making gains past three months, I feel like that is like pretty strong incidents incidental evidence for novelty being relatively important because <laughs> it does seem like even even in what you described as a luxury training environment it does seem like like 12 weeks is is about all you got um at least for a lot of folks so yeah i don't i don't know i i do think i do think novelty is important i a uh, potential or, or something that's been rattling around in in my brain um my the plan for my dissertation is to be specifically on on skeletal muscle resensitization it's kind of like is there a, a micro novelty effect um mm. with, with like the ennis study that that came out recently of course the the average volumes were different mm -hmm. um but also the two groups that 
saw greater hypertrophy, at least in terms of effect sizes. Uh, they took a, a volume progression approach. So in, anyway, from kind of looking at that, any research we have that does give some insight into uh, kind of a volume progression or a volume cycling type of approach, um, as well, including that Ennis study, again, looking at those again through with kind of a different lens, I'm becoming more sympathetic to that type of training approach um, because it could provide this sort of novelty effect on a shorter time scale um, if there is inherent value to, to the novelty. Um, but that could be completely off base, but you know, should All right. have some experimental insights into this. I hate, I hate to, I hate to keep going down this rabbit hole. I was going to try to get us back to effective reps, but got to keep going with this. So I know you guys are probably aware of this really is of turning into the, the data driven strength aspartame episode. <laughs> hey, right, we can break it up into multiple parts. It'll be fine. Um, so to kind of counter what you guys are saying, again, I'm, I'm on the same side of it. There's probably a window that you don't want to be on the other side, at least from an effectiveness standpoint, because there's a few of those studies by DeMoss where they basically do like a random uh, alteration of the training session. Um, I think it was like just one of them off the top of my head is like high load, low load, eccentric, overload, uh, rest interval, yeah. something yeah. like that. And they kind of cycle through those randomly. Um, it wasn't worse, which I think also kind of goes against the narrative of like, you have to stay on the exact same training regimen to see an adaptive response, mm -hmm. but it also wasn't better. Um, but they didn't do volume progression to, to your, your point, Josh. So maybe that's the, the, in the acute sense, that's the most important variable, but that I, I think those are interesting to add to the fire of this tangent. <laughs> yeah. I, I could take that Damas study and, and, you know, make a, make an argument from both sides for sure. Uh, yeah, there's also the De Camargo, I believe is how you pronounce it. That's almost mm -hmm. certainly not how you pronounce it, but they had a, a meta-analysis. It was from like three or four studies. They, they effectively did like a meta-analysis on the individual subjects, um, looking at changes in training volume and uh, resultant, resultant growth, um, kind of independent of the absolute training volumes they used during the experiments. And they did see a relationship. Now, you could interpret the relationship in many ways with the data they reported, it was, it's kind of hard to, to make sense of, at least from my perspective, again, from what they reported, but man, uh, if you see a relationship there outside of like, like, like just thinking about all the variables that would have gone into what drives an individual to, to grow or not to grow. If you see any relationship there, it does make me wonder if, if there's something so. Anyway, I have a lot of thinking to do on this uh, in the next few months before I, uh, I propose my dissertation. My my memory of that of that uh, De Camargo paper, and and I could I could be completely misremembering it, was that the studies that fed into it didn't have volume progression in terms of like increases in sets. I, I I wasn't it just like volume load progression. Yeah, yeah. So so yeah. what they did is they had pre training volumes for all of the subjects. And then of course they had the assigned training volume. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And they were able right. to say like, okay, if you increased, if you decrease volume, you go in this bucket. If you increased by zero to 50%, you go in this bucket. If you increased by more than 50%. And you're talking about set volume. To yeah, that's right, that's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. There, there, there's some clues um, or, or some hints that it's, it's something worth looking at. Um, but unless you guys have anything to add Kind of on this novelty or set progression front might be a good time to okay take all uh take all the caution off the table to whatever degree you feel comfortable and uh just get to some of the i guess our practical takes because at the end of the day got to train got to coach people and you know you have to do that despite the uncertainty so i guess do you guys have any final thoughts on the novelty stuff or anything to, to throw out there I was going to take us down one more mechanistic rabbit hole if we want to, but if both you guys are tapped out, I can definitely hold that to another conversation. But um, I don't know what you guys think, Josh. You're you're the adult in the room. What do you think? I'm I'm <laughs> I'm not opposed to it, but it's uh, we're going on three hours. So. Greg, you want to well, I want to respect your time. Do you want another tangent mechanisms rabbit hole or no? Uh, I mean, I've I've got another hour fifteen before my shot. 
<sighs> I'm glad you didn't say the the name of the shot because then uh, this would be, <laughs> this YouTube might th this video might not have uh, this getting video. taken down. Yeah, there we go. Um, all right, I'm I'm gonna. I'm going to give you the diet version. Maybe we can still get, so we're going to have a hard, hard 30 minute cap on this part of it. And then we can get to the last uh, 30 potentially of uh, the practical stuff. So I guess, I guess the one thing are, that are, are we not going to talk about uh, is force maximized on the fiber level? That, that's, 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 that's what I was going to bring okay, up. Okay. Uh, yeah. That, that's what I was going to bring up. Cause I, I, I wasn't going to make all your notes on this. Go to waste. Um, so I, I guess I guess the thing I was going to put forth is ultimately, Josh, kind of the way that me, me and you have tried to put together some of this research and kind of one of the things it hinges upon is kind of that that tensile uh, force that individual fibers experience close to failure um, is kind of one of the things we've we've speculated, maybe explaining kind of how things work, um, as we've already said in this episode clearly that's not the only factor that is responsible for the entire cascade. And I don't think we've ever made claims associated with that, but I do think it, it would, it would be something I would put forth as kind of like a, a decent mental model to kind of explain some of the longitudinal outcomes that we've seen. Um, but definitely not the way I would use, like, I wouldn't use that as the primary way to prescribe training more. So taking the longitudinal outcomes and kind of back calculating, okay, how could this kind of make sense? So I guess, I guess to kind of explain the way that I think about it, and then we can get to the point you just talked about, about is force maximized on the fiber level as we near failure is that, okay, in a set to failure with heavy loads somewhere 80% plus, we are near maximizing, if not totally maximizing motor unit recruitment kind of out the gate. If we're using maximal concentric intended velocity on every rep as kind of a given throughout this example. So all the motor units are recruited, all the fibers that they innervate are presumably activated. And as we kind of progress closer to failure, each one of those fibers is kind of sensing or feeling, as you've said earlier, a large mass, right? So the, the whole muscle force is decreasing throughout the set. And then presumably the fibers that are kind of minimally fatigued at the end of the set are kind of sensing on a per fiber level, the highest amount of um, amount of force, because it's a given amount of torque that's distributed over a fewer number of fibers that are not a, like fatigued a ton, basically mm -hmm. is kind of, so that's, that's the logic we get to say that, okay, initially whole muscle force is the greatest, but it's distributed across the greatest number of active fibers. Thus, per fiber tension or per fiber, per fiber force is low. Then as we progress throughout a set, some fibers fatigue, I think that's going to be kind of the, the interesting kind of discussion associated with this. Some fibers fatigue, therefore the mass that we're now distributing or the torque requirements is being distributed on a fewer number of fibers that are, that are producing force such that the force on those fibers is increasing. Um, also the force velocity relationship on the fiber level is also going to play into that. That's kind of how you get to that rationale. Now, conversely, for a low load set, the idea would be there is that we kind of need fatigue or need to um, have some sort of uh, requirement that necessitates greater motor unit recruitment throughout that set. Mm -hmm. So we have a smaller absolute mass that's being distributed over a small pool of fibers because it does not necessitate maximal motor unit recruitment to lift that mass. So throughout that entire set, we basically have high per fiber mechanical tension because at any one snapshot in time, there's a smaller pool of fibers that are basically contributing to the loading demands. And this is kind of sort of what EMG research has kind of picked up over the years is that any one snapshot for a low load set, EMG tends to be a little bit lower. But if you kind of summate it or look at the area under the curve, you kind of get a different kind of uh, line of reasoning. And so at the end of that low load set. Well, and, and right now with... Um with like the, the EMGD comp techniques, yeah. they can, they can look at it oh, on the level of a motor unit. Yep. Yep. Um, and so I'm not going to pretend to play hardball with that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, so any, anyway, as you kind of get um, towards the end of the set for low loads, presumably that's when the highest threshold motor units that are innervating the fibers that we assume grow the most, 
those ones will be under the highest amount of uh, per fiber tension, distributing, lifting that mass. Thus, that's kind of how you arrive at the idea that, okay, at the end of a set to failure, both with heavy and low loads, the, the, low, the high loads that kind of have high tension um, throughout, but with low loads, it's really at the end of the set that the per fiber force is high is kind of the, 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 uh, the idea from our perspective. Now, whether or not that is the only thing to care about in that equation, as we already mentioned, as you go through that process, metabolic stress is also accumulating. So that very much could have an, uh, an, an a secondary influence on this entire cascade. I'm not going to rehash our entire conversation that we just had, but okay. With that kind of line of reasoning put forth, and I believe that's kind of one of the underlying premises of the effective reps model, at least in the hard sense, mm -hmm. what do you think about that? What are your, um, challenges to it, et cetera? Yeah. I, I, so I think that, um, I think that most of that is true. The, um, the, the open question is not whether the highest threshold motor units are at their highest level of tension that they will achieve during the set at the end of a set, but rather whether the tension achieved by those highest threshold motor units is particularly close to the it's maximum normal. tension yeah. they can yeah. generate by the yeah. end of a set. Um, Cause like uh, essentially the, the effective reps idea is predicated on the idea that like each fiber has to achieve a pretty high tension threshold, like near maximal per fiber tension for it to stimulate a hypertrophic response. So that that's kind of the, the, um, like, like new nuanced, uh, discussion question. Um, and I kind of think that it probably depends pr probably pretty heavily on what loads you're lifting. Um, like I, I think that it's, I think that it's very plausible that with a relatively heavy load, um, like most fibers and most motor units will be exposed to something approaching maximal tension. Um, I, I, I do wonder how close to their theoretical maximums they actually get to just because during normal dynamic training, you're constrained by concentric force production, which is lower than isometric force production. Um, and you, you will still experience some degree of like motor unit cycling or like fatigue within motor units. And so, you know, for instance, if you have a pool of uh, 150 motor units that are being recruited and the one with the highest recruitment threshold is still recruited from, from the very jump, but it is also the most glycolytic, it fatigues the fastest, maybe like if you're doing a set of eight, it's recruited on set one, but it can't achieve maximal tension because uh, velocity is still relatively high. And then it fatigues throughout the set. And then by the, by the point that contraction velocities are relatively slow and theoretically uh, the, the fibers are contracting slow enough that a fiber could theoretically achieve maximal tension. By that point, the highest threshold motor unit might already be fatigued enough that it is no longer capable of generating maximal tension. Like I, I think that that's, um, I think that that's possible, but I do, I do think that, um, most motor units are probably, uh, being exposed to quite a bit of tension from the jump and are being exposed to quite a bit of tension throughout. Um, so yeah, like, I, I think that that's probably quite plausible with heavy training with lighter training though. Um, I think that it's probably worth referencing a 2017 paper by Potvin and Fuglevand. I'm, I know I'm butchering that, but Russia. I'm doing my best. Um, which was, uh, so the title of the paper is a, a motor unit based model of muscle fatigue. Um, and so this was a model meant to be like directly applied to isometric exercise, but I think it still like conceptually applies to dynamic exercise. Um, and one of the predictions of this model, so like one thing to note about it is like the underlying logic of this model is um, kind of like 
baked in to the effective reps idea. Like they're both predicated on Hinneman size principle or the principle of orderly recruitment. The idea that as force demands uh, are sustained over time, you need to recruit more motor units. The new motor units you recruit will need to uh, ramp up in terms of the tension they're generating and their firing rates to make up for other motor units that are fatiguing throughout a set. Like that's, that, that is the same logic baked into this model. And it would predict that with like moderate to low loads, the highest threshold motor units probably don't get particularly close to their maximal tension. Um, and the reason for that is just that like enough other motor units are fatiguing over time. So like, for instance, if, um, and, and, and like, this is another one where like podcast medium might not be the best. Like there, there are, if, if, if describing the meta analysis, oh, man, uh, trend line, would be tough. I am not even going to attempt yeah, to describe it's a it. rainbow. Done. Um, <laughs> Like, like, even if you're looking at them, it, it takes you a second to figure out what's going on with them. Um, but yeah, like in, in essence, what, what they would predict is that by the time your highest threshold motor units are being recruited, your other high threshold motor units have already been recruited and have been recruited long enough that they have fatigued enough that your total capacity to produce force is already approaching task failure such that like your highest threshold motor units never actually ramp all the way up to like full contraction strength before you actually fail. So like for instance, um, like like modeling uh, like an isometric contraction to failure with 50% of one RM, um, they, they modeled 120 motor units with motor unit 120 uh, producing, having the, the capability to contract with a hundred times more force than motor unit one. Um, by the time that you were reaching failure, uh, with 50% of one RM, like your other high threshold motor units, like 80, 90, a hundred, 105, whatever have already been recruited and have already been fatiguing such that by the time 120 comes in, it gets up to about like 25%, um, like 25% of its maximal contraction strength uh, before enough other stuff has fatigued that you just fail. Um, and like, I think that that is probably relatively likely um, to, to occur because like, so if it was just, if that was just based on a single modeling study, I'd be like, ah, who knows? Like, you know, all models are wrong. Some are useful. How useful is this one? I don't know, whatever. But um, there have been some other papers. So there was a 2020 paper by Miller titled Neural Drive is Greater for a Higher Intensity Contraction Than for Moderate Intensity Contractions Performed to Fatigue. And a 2018 paper by Muddle um, that was like largely similar, where essentially like, like in vivo, they actually had people, um, you know, uh, do isometric contractions at different force targets um, to the point of fatigue and kind of looked at, uh, li like using like really sophisticated EMG decomposition techniques so that instead of just looking at, you know, total amplitudes or, or mean power frequency or whatever, like you, you can decompose and look at each individual motor unit and look to see kind of like when each motor unit is recruited, like its recruitment threshold is kind of like a proxy for, um, how high threshold it is and it's, it's firing rate is kind of like a proxy for how much tension it's generating. Um, and what they found is that like, yeah, uh, you, you were seeing similarly high threshold motor units, uh, eventually being recruited before the point of failure with high versus low contraction intensities, but the like highest threshold motor units that were recruited last never actually like ramped up to the same uh, like firing rates as they did with, uh, they, they never ramped up to as high of firing rates with lower contraction intensities as higher contraction intensities, which is kind of like in vivo confirmation of some of those predictions of the Poppin model. Um, 
suggesting that like, yeah, the, those high threshold motor units are recruited um, and they do generate some tension, but they probably don't get particularly close to generating maximal tension. Um, and like to give Chris, so the, the, ah, haven't said his name yet. The main proponent of this model is Chris Beardsley. And, uh, I didn't come into this podcast to talk shit about an individual, but eh, like at, at this point, still not talking shit, but he has like specifically addressed this claim before. And it's hard to say, oh, someone has said something about this. Uh, so eh, whatever I had to say the name. But yeah, so he he has pushed back against this before, um, citing a study by Kay and colleagues, uh, arguing that eh, like the Potvin model and, and this isometric stuff is not at all relevant to normal dynamic training. Um, because in essence, the kind of central fatigue that you experience with isometric training uh, is way greater and occurs way faster than the central fatigue you experience with uh, like eccentric or concentric contractions. And mm, the the paper he cited, and it will will this be linked in the show notes for people to check out on their own? So the the paper he cited, like I I, I credit him for uh, addressing this criticism that I've had previously. Uh, I give him a bit less credit for selecting the paper he did to attempt to make this point because uh, it's kind of a mess. So in essence, the subjects in the study completed 100 seconds of maximal eccentric, concentric, and isometric knee extension reps. Um, and they observed larger decrements in force and larger decreases in EMG following the isometric reps than the eccentric or concentric reps. And there are like several methodological things I could point out about this study um, that weren't ideal. For instance, they did all three testing sessions on the same day, separated by 10 minutes. And after you've done 100 seconds of maximal eccentric contractions, I don't know that you're going to be able to do a great job of doing 100 seconds of anything else 10 minutes later, but eh, whatever. Um, the, the big methodological nit that I need to pick um, is just that they didn't come anywhere particularly close to like equating the actual fatigue stimulus in that the isometric stimulus was continuous and the eccentric and concentric were both intermittent. So essentially with isometric, you were holding the contraction for a hundred seconds straight. And with the eccentric and concentric stimulus, um, like they were doing it on a isokinetic dyna dynamometer where like it, it doesn't work just like a knee extension machine would like if you're doing concentrics, like you, um, like you have to kick into it going up, but then, uh, like it, the way they had it set up is like, it would engage then kind of like a concentric knee flexion contraction that they, uh, basically made like really light so that they wouldn't fatigue the hamstrings as well. But basically like they, they found that, Hey, like being all on like contracting your quads for as hard as possible for a hundred straight seconds is more fatiguing than contracting your quads for one second and then relaxing for half a second and then contracting for a second and relaxing for half a second. Like that's, that's what they were doing with the eccentric and concentric reps. Like they weren't like constantly under load. And so, yeah, like obviously uh, <laughs> the isometric um, approach caused more fatigue just because like it was like objectively a harder thing that they were asking the subjects to do. So it's not really like a fair representation of the fatigue, the, the, the fatigue that would be induced by isometrics kind of writ large. Um, and then the other major problem with the study is just that like the data is like clearly bad. Um, and I don't say that in kind of like a cherry picking, like special pleading type of way. Um, like they observed zero force decrements following a hundred seconds of maximal eccentric contractions, which um, you will never find another paper with those findings because uh, like, like that would, that would be God, probably cause it was, it was 60 degrees per second for the active part in 120. So it, it would be, oh man, I should have done this beforehand. I think it would have been about 50 to 60 maximal eccentric reps 
Um, yeah, P people experience force decrements after that 100% of the time, all individuals, all the time. Um, like, again, I don't like speaking in absolutes, but if they're observing no force decrements, they just did a, a really poor job of making sure they were getting similar levels of effort out of their subjects for all of the testing protocols. So like, eh, like it's, it's a bad study with bad data. Um, and so like, there there have there have been like more recent studies that I guess can be linked in the show notes. There was a 2021 paper by Royer that um, I think did a better job investigating this thing. Again, eccentrics, concentrics, isometrics. Um, they matched according to the torque time interval to make sure that the amount of work done in each uh, condition was equated. And they found pretty similar decrements in force and pretty similar changes in voluntary activation uh, with all three contraction modes, which would suggest that central fatigue was probably pretty similar um, with all three contraction modes. Um, and there was also a paper that Chris could have cited if he wanted to that would have made the point that he was trying to make with the K paper, but it is a better paper. Um, it's by Babolt in 2006. Um, I, I won't bore you with the details of it, but like you, you could interpret its findings to suggest that um, fatigue generated during isometric contractions versus concentric contractions. With isometrics, it might be more central fatigue. With concentric, it might be more peripheral. So like there, there might be some different fatigue mechanisms there. Um, but that is ultimately like that still wouldn't fully kind of get around the predictions of the Potvin model. Um, because like, I think, I think in, in arguing against it, Chris may have not like fully understood it, honestly. <laughs> um, like the, the thing he pushed back against was like, oh, the, the Potvin model is like predicting um, decrements and firing rates due to central uh, fatigue, but like there's way more central fatigue with isometric contractions than dynamic contractions. Therefore, like it wouldn't apply, but the, the decrements in, um, in firing rate due to fatigue in the Potvin model are actually like quite modest. And uh, with the example I gave before of the highest threshold motor unit only reaching about 25% of its maximum uh, contractile capacity in that simulation, it was predicted to have like to be unfatigued enough that it would have been capable of generating up to 95% of its maximal theoretical force. So like that just wasn't that that's that's not a factor like heavily influencing the interpretation of this, like with reference to the Potvin model. Um so yeah, like I don't know. I don't think that that is particularly persuasive. And it also, I don't think would make that much of a difference if there were different fatigue mechanisms because the highest threshold motor units in general would also tend to be the ones that are more metabolically fatigable. So like if that was the thing like driving the predictions of the Potvin model, which again, it's not, um, like, like differences in kind of like central motor drive affecting um, uh, like contraction frequency or uh, uh, firing rates, I mean, like, even if that were the thing and you wanted to say, no, 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 like that's not relevant. It, it is actually more about peripheral fatigue. Those higher threshold motor units do also just experience faster peripheral fatigue than lower threshold motor units do. So, um, it's kind of like sidestepping it without like actually, addressing anything but again like it's also not particularly relevant here because oh man this would be this would be such better content if people could actually see the graphs but here's, but a, here's it, one question i guess in, in, in essence in essence like the higher the highest threshold motor units are predicted to not reach anywhere particularly close to maximal uh contraction strength because those other motor units are, are fatiguing, not because the highest threshold motor units are fatiguing like super fast. Gotcha. Um, I, I guess one question I have in terms of the interpretation of the Potvin model specifically to the contraction mode 
is more of a like logistical thing that I've wondered in terms of the influence of it. So if I, if I recall correctly, the only one of the simulations that reached near maximal or maximal firing rates for the highest threshold motor units was the like the MVIC, like the 100% mm -hmm. of uh, the isometric torque. One thing with dynamic versus isometric contractions that I feel like is potentially important is that necessarily from a sub-maximal isometric force task, you cannot apply maximal concentric effort. Yeah. And I, I wonder if that, I don't really have a point here other than conceivably in a dynamic task, applying maximal concentric effort would presumably influence the number of motor units recruited and mm -hmm. ultimately influence the fatigue dynamics thereof. Because just like you said, if anything, the highest threshold motor units would be the ones that are fatiguing the fastest. Um, and if they're exposed to fatigue earlier in a set, based on the fact that they're recruited because you're using maximal concentric effort in a dynamic task compared to an isometric task, I wonder how that kind of plays out in the calculus. I don't know if you ever kind of thought about that limitation of the isometric model. I, I, I have. Yeah. Um, and, and I, and I think that what you were saying does so, okay. So, so just kind of like first things first, um, there, there are like absolutely limitations to applying an isometric model to kind of making predictions about what would happen during dynamic exercise. But I also think that just like the critique of you can't apply this one-to-one -one, um, doesn't therefore prove that you reach maximal tension with high threshold motor units. Um, it just means that like the, the, the evidence against that idea isn't super strong, but uh, that there is no strong evidence to support the idea that you're reaching maximal tension with your highest threshold motor units during dynamic exercise. Um, but then kind of like more, more directly addressing that question, like, yeah, I, I think you're right. Like, so if, if, um, you're contracting with maximal intended force with a 50% of one RM load, instead of just maintaining, uh, 50% of MVIC with, with, uh, an isometric load. Like those, those are two different things. You're, you are probably recruiting more total motor units from the jump with, uh, the, the 50% of one RM, uh, dynamic contractions. Um, and let's just say for the sake of argument that you are recruiting your very highest threshold motor units from the jump. Like I, I kind of don't think you are, but like, let's just assume you are. Um, then I think what, what you're alluding to, like fatigue dynamics being in play, like I think that would be very relevant because like if, if the principle of orderly recruitment still applies, which like I think it does, if you were actually recruiting those highest threshold motor units from the jump, they would not be anywhere close to their maximal firing rate or generating anywhere close to their maximal tension. Um, I, I mean, in part, just because like total contraction speed would still be very fast because it's the start of a set with 50%. Um, but yeah, like the, they, they wouldn't be generating maximal tension then. Um, and, and, and like, even if the contraction velocity was slow for some reason, which like, I don't know how it could be, but like, let's just say theoretically it was just because the force demands are so low, you would be getting like maximal force out of your lower threshold motor units and just kind of like the amount, the, the, the closeness of each motor unit to its maximal tension as you go up, um, the recruitment order would, would just keep going down. So like, even if you were recruiting that highest threshold motor unit, it would be recruited and it wouldn't be doing much. Like it would, it would be at a relatively low tension relative to its maximal. And then if it stays recruited, like it is going to be a relatively fatigable motor unit. Like the, the force with which it would need to contract would need to increase throughout the set. Um, like as other motor units fatigued and as it is being recruited and used longer and longer, it will continue to fatigue. And so like by the time other motor units have tapped out and like it does need to do more, it, it would have 
whether due to central or peripheral factors, have fatigued enough that it would be unable to achieve its like maximal tension. One, one. Um, uh, sorry, just to piggyback off that. One reason I kind of believe that there's another study that I think, I, 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 not a lot of people know about it, but I think it's a really interesting one in terms of the proximity to failure cases. A study by Lim, and they basically had three groups. One of them was 80% of failure. One of them was 30% of failure. And then one of them was 30% of 1RM, which was volume load matched by manipulating repetitions per set to the 80% of 1RM condition. Mm -hmm. And by effect, you have a low load group that I think, if I recall, is like at least like 10 reps in reserve. And mm -hmm. presumably, by the, the model that we've kind of put forth here, that wouldn't even come close to recruiting the highest threshold motor units then, but actually the fiber type that saw meaningful hypertrophy there was type two fibers rather than type one. Mm -hmm. And of course that is confounded by the fact that potentially type two fibers just grow more in general. But nonetheless, I find that as an interesting observation to say like in dynamic contractions, it's at least plausible that like we're getting maximum motor unit recruitment maybe a little bit earlier than we would expect um, which obviously has all the implications on the fatigue dynamics that you're talking about. So, yeah, but, but I, I think you would also agree that if those high threshold motor units were being recruited during the, the 30% work match condition, they probably weren't getting particularly for close. Sure, for sure. Yeah. I, I agree with that to be clear. I just, I think yeah. that's a, to me, that is a data point that is hard to explain if, if the, if the conditions necessary for the the highest threshold motor units to produce hypertrophy only can occur at the end of the set where we're presuming that their firing rates are maxed out. I, I yeah. think that that is basically implausible if that's the case, which I agree with you that um, that that doesn't really seem to to match up from what I understand. Yeah. So I, I have kind of like two two things just to kind of like put a put a bow on this um, that that I think relate to what you're saying. One is that, um, eh, actually three things. First is just that uh, we, we do just kind of take it on faith that a fiber needs to be recruited in order to grow. Um, I don't, like, I, I'm, I'm willing to accept that as an assumption, but I'm not actually like super confident in that assumption. One of the reasons why just has to do with like, it is still kind of an open question of what the primary mechanosensors are. And um, like two possibilities that have been put forth are uh, like, like costumere associated mechanosensors and um, nuclear compression as, as like that itself being mechanosensitive. And so if those are our <laughs> tension sensors, um, then like the, um, the endomycium that's like surrounding all of the muscle fibers, if a single fiber contracts, it is pulling on the endomycium, which is then like the endomycium pulls on the other muscle fibers. And so if it's like a threshold of shearing force needs to be reached on those costumere proteins in order to change their conformation to kind of like kick all of that off, I don't see why it wouldn't be possible for surrounding fibers to contract, create tension on the connective tissue matrix, and that tension on the connective tissue matrix to create tension on a costumere protein for a fiber that hasn't been activated. Like if, if those are like uh, some of the important mechanosensors, that, that would at least open the door for a fiber not needing to be recruited and generating active fiber tension of its own in order for mechanical tension to kick off a hypertrophy signaling cascade in that fiber. Um, and similar with like nuclear deformation, if basically like the muscle getting a pump, uh, like creates enough pressure in the muscle that it compresses the nucleus. Again, like if, if you generate a pump like that, that is, that should be more or less equally distributed uh, for everything under the epimyceum. So everything including fibers that are not recruited. So anyway, I, th that all of which is to say, that's kind of like the, the maximal, like skeptical shithead approach to this. Like if, if you wanted to be like maximally skeptical, you could like credibly argue that we don't actually have evidence that a fiber needs to be recruited in order to grow because we don't. But 
if we were still to accept that assumption, um, it's also like not obvious to me that a fiber needs to approach its maximal tension um, in order for tension associated um, mechano sensors to be able to like pick it up and kind of start that signaling cascade. And one of the reasons I say that is like largely just kind of logistical, I guess. So the, I, the idea with mechano sensors is that some sort of force is placed upon them and that force being placed upon them changes the conformation of the protein such that it can interact with other proteins, like set up a secondary messenger system, phosphorylate them, like who, who knows, whatever. And like proteins are kind of dumb. Like they, <laughs> they don't, they don't have intelligence. Like they, they respond to just whatever like external um, stimulus is like placed upon them. And so like if there, if there was some sort of tension sensitive uh, mechano sensor that like, like, let's just say it needs, like, let's just say it's a costumier associated protein. And if, uh, and if three Newtons of force are put upon, like three Newtons of shearing force are put upon that protein, that is sufficient to change its conformation such that it can then phosphorylate downstream proteins and get things going. Um, I don't, I, I am unaware of a mechanism by which that tension threshold would change as someone got stronger. Um, and so like, you know, if, if, if it's going, it, like, if it takes like what, whatever the threshold, like just X Newtons of force in order to like actually change the conformation of that protein for it to do what it needs to do. That should just be the same for that protein, regardless of individual. And um, like that, I would think would equate to a higher percentage of fiber force in some people than others. And I think that it wouldn't necessarily, and, and I think it would be like like fiber type and, and motor unit number would be relevant as well. Um, cause like if you have similar mechano sensors in your smaller, weaker type one fibers as your bigger, stronger type two fibers and the type one fibers are capable, like the, your smallest, weakest type one fibers are capable of contracting with enough force to kind of like trigger that mechano sensor. It seems unlikely that your biggest, strongest type two fibers would also need to contract with maximal force in order to like stimulate that same mechano sensor. Um, and so, yeah, like I, like just, just, just based on the way that like mechanosensitive proteins work, I, I don't see a mechanism by which you would need to generate maximal fiber tension. And as the maximum tension, a fiber can generate changes that the sensitivity of the protein to tension would scale one-to-one -one with the changes in capacity to generate fiber tension. Um, which is, which is just like another reason that I'm like quite skeptical that you need to approach maximal, maximal fiber tension in order to kind of like kick this off or, or even like maximally kick it off, you know? Um, so th those were two things. And then the third thing um, is just that like, I wonder how a lot of this would relate to type one fiber hypertrophy, just because like, low threshold motor units are recruited all the time. And even for like a low, like, like for a low velocity, low force thing, your lower, th your lowest threshold motor units are probably being recruited and, and being exposed to something approaching near maximal tension. Um, and even though we see less type one fiber hypertrophy than type two following training, we do still see like pretty robust type one fiber hypertrophy. And I, yeah, like I, I wonder about that because those fibers should be getting exposed to their near maximal tension, like pretty frequently. And so like a resistance training stimulus would seem to be like completely redundant. Like the, like your, your, your five lowest threshold motor units don't know the difference between a max squat and like walking up the stairs. And so like, why should a resistance training stimulus cause growth in those fibers? Um, 
And I mean, I think that it is because there's a lot of other biological perturbations associated with a resistance training stimulus and that it's not just all about tension. But if it is, if it is all about tension, like that's, that's a head scratcher, you know? Josh, anything to say there, Chief, before I take us into uh, some practical wrap-ups? No, I don't. I don't think I have anything directly to add on that. Um, I know that limb paper kind of always scratched our heads about Zach that, that you brought yeah. up, and Greg, you brought up some uh, some conceptual kind of framing to uh, a similar issue we've thought of, and I and I mentioned. I mentioned there was a time period where we were pretty far away from any sort of effective reps model mm -hmm. and kind of our, our uh, hand wavy motor unit physiology <laughs> explanation was like, man, why, why would the most fatigable muscle fibers require the most fatigue in the set to experience maximum tension? And then I think you added a, a few layers for me to chew on in terms of, yeah you know, is, is the tension actually what's, what's driving it in all cases, right? As, as we've talked about. Yeah. So I think that was good. I'm probably gonna have to, to listen to it back. <laughs> think uh, about it some more. Yeah, no, applying counterfactuals in those examples, I think is just a, a listener to take away from any kind of model that's been put forward. I think applying counterfactuals to that and like testing those on the evidence that those would be supported with is a good practice, um, for kind of all things like that. But, but yeah, so we've come a long way. We've come, you know, from humble beginnings all the way through the, the, uh, the valleys of despair. Um, and now we're, you know, we're, we're back on the other side of this conversation back on sunshine road. Um, and Greg's going to give us his, his kind of opinions and we can kind of talk through this on, all right, clearly we don't know everything. But as we've said a few times throughout this conversation, you do have to eventually train. You have to write down your best guess, your best approximation of all these mechanisms and put something down on a training program. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately the question here is given this uncertainty, given these um, multiple inputs to the kind of the mechanistic underpinnings that eventually play out in the longitudinal evidence that we had, and ultimately the meta regression was the, the summary of if I'm to ask you, given all that data and your practical experience, kind of you're performing, you know, a couple sets, let's, let's say four for a multi-joint exercise on average, on average in the muscle groups, things like that. I'm, I'm pinning your arm down and making you give on average kind of recommendations and, and you're not allowed to put on your context hat here too much. Kind of what, what does the RIR look like for those kind of uh, four sets on a multi-joint exercise when hypertrophy is the goal? For let's say the average listener, you know, been training for you know five years or so, looking to kind of get that that second spurt of progress as they approach um, kind of the advanced status. If if I'm doing four sets, either e either just taking everything to failure or leaving like two to four RAR for the first three sets and taking the last one to failure. Okay, cool. And so is that dependent on? So I know, I know you're someone who cares about strength. I'm specifically mm -hmm. talking about this case, throw that out the window. You don't care, but it's a multi-joint exercise for hypertrophy. Does that change the answer at all? Just the extra piece of context. It may not. I'm just double checking. Um, it, the, the, the exercise affects it more than anything else. Um, okay, cool. just, just kind of like how safe do I feel going yeah. to failure? And also Definitely. like, how much does a set to failure fuck me up? Yep. Uh, and like, what load am I training with? Like for, for instance, if it's like leg press and I'm doing sets of 25, I'm not doing four sets to failure. Are you kidding me? Like I, I shit myself and throw up <laughs> set two, and then like set three and four aren't happening. Yep. Um, but if it's like bench press and I have a spotter, I trust, like I'm taking all of those sets to failure and like, I'm not even thinking about it. Cool. Okay. So, so underlying that. I'm assuming at least to some capacity, although the degree to which this is the case is obviously up for interpretation. You believe there is some sort of additional ROI that comes from those last couple of reps up to failure. Is that an accurate statement? Um, you know, I think 
the 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 thing making a difference for me there is that it's four sets. Um, if it was like six or eight, I'd probably say like two or three. Okay. Um, but I I do I do think like I'm not going to reduce everything to tension, but I do think just like the global magnitude of the stimulus is relevant. Yeah. And if you're getting if you're getting four sets and that's it, I think that it's relatively unlikely that you're going to like the the stimulus that you can cause is going to like exceed your ability to productively adapt to it. And so I just kind of think like, well, maximize the stimulus, you know, yeah. and all Got else it. being equal, going to failure will give you a larger stimulus than not. Perfect. Okay. That makes perfect sense. And so I'm assuming for a single joint exercise, given what you just kind of mentioned, basically the balancing act of the stimulus that presumably, you know, is to some degree maximized at failure, you're balancing that with your ability to maintain that quality of work over a session for a single joint exercise for four sets, probably taking that all to failure as well, or almost no, always. No question. No, no question. question. Yeah. There we go. Sweet. Dude, if, if I meet someone that says that they do bicep curls with three <laughs> RIR, it is on site. Like, <laughs> get get out of the gym you don't right, belong. there it is there it is folks that's the that's the uh clip it clip it right there there it is um yeah no i i i think from a conceptual standpoint i think i agree i, I think about this as you know we kind of have the two relationships and on an individual level level the the optimization game you're trying to kind of play out is theoretically we assume the stimulus is maximized towards failure but we want the quality of the entire session to be as high as possible and so if that is if that is a concern in the organization of training that you have exercise selection loading range how many sets you're doing for the total session etc then the proximity of failure is manipulated to kind of account for that mm -hmm. and that's I, I think we're in total agreement there josh do you have anything to add on that one um i do think pacing is a thing um and that sometimes drives me to like the rer side of things staying a little bit shy of failure um I, I do think a, a primary variable here is kind of like the, the question was was framed in, you know, with, with the constraints of, of four sets, you know, wh where are you stopping? Um, and that, I think that leads nicely into into the next question, um, which is something we're we'll hopefully have Go for some. It. Uh, Go for it. Yes, we'll have some experimental insight into this as soon as I sit down and analyze like 250 ultrasound images. Um, but okay, let's say you have the the opportunity to kind of prioritize one or one or two, or sorry, one of these variables, right? Training volume, so so number of sets, um, or proximity to failure. Um, wh which of those are you kind of biasing? And, and perhaps a reasonable example here is like three or four sets all the way to failure, or are you going to, you know, bump up that RIR and add some sets, um, or is that kind of a, a pick your poison in, in your view? Uh, man, I'm, I'm going to give a cop out answer here, um, which is that I, I think that there's like pretty big inter individual differences in terms of like, whether people respond to more of an intensity stimulus or a volume stimulus, like, I, I've, I've known so many people who just swear that like, high volume is the best for them. And they tried lower volume closer to failure. And it did, did nothing. And I've known so many people who've said the exact opposite that like they spun their wheels with high volume and like cutting it way back and like going closer to failure like that very reliably produces gains for them. And like, I don't think any of them are lying or misinterpreting their experience. I, I think that it's true. And that some people do just respond better to more of an intensity stimulus. And some people do just respond better to more of a volume stimulus. And I'm not totally sure why, um, but if you're asking me personally, um, I'm I'm going to failure um, and then not scaling weekly volume because high volume beats the shit out of me. Um, like I, I would I would rather take like th three sets where I meet God near the end of them uh, on every one than twelve sets where I have like five reps in reserve every day of the week. Yeah. See, I feel the, I feel almost the complete opposite. Um, not necessarily five RER, but, uh, you know, I've specifically, once we kind of had these, these regressions on my hand, I was like, okay, I see, I see where this is going to go in terms of a lot of folks, interpretations and, and applications. So I spent a, a, a few months doing 
almost everything to to momentary failure. Um, I don't think it went that well. Uh, that that did come with a a reduction in in volume, but then when I mm -hmm. kind of came back to to a little bit more of a moderate approach, everything seemed to to get going again. Um, but yeah, I, I I I do think there are that that definitely aligns with my observations as well that some folks. Um, some folks, per perhaps it's just a tolerance of, of failure, um, or I guess it could be a tolerance of the additional sets, right? Uh, cause those are kind of different stimuli, at least to some degree. And I'm starting to think of, of hypertrophy training in terms of working backwards from what's desirable. And to me, what's desirable is high volumes and all the way to failure. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of work within practical constraints from there, i.e., is this going to absolutely smoke you? Are you going to have like, you know, your, your, your training quads and then hamstrings? Are you going to have absolutely zero mental energy left for hamstrings? That sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so perhaps it's, it's kind of like these indirect factors, not truly how you respond in isolation to the stimulus, but instead uh, some of those downstream effects in terms of, you know, what you can uh, cram in within a, a a training block, for example. Yeah, no, I I, yeah. I I agree with that very strongly. Nice, Zach. Sweet. Um, I'm gonna skip the long muscle length one. I think that's. Yeah. I think. Yeah, I'm gonna skip that one. Um, last one here, Greg. Be respectful of your time. Um. Can't I, can't, I can't say that anymore. Yeah, I can't say that anymore. Um, yeah, that's just that's uh, uh, that was a miss. Um, okay, so not being respectful of your time, being very selfish. Um, how, so let's say let's say you are you know a lifter in your case where for whatever reason um, tolerating like high volumes seems to just not be the thing. Um, but let's say you're on the opposite end of the spectrum where it's proximity to failure that be, seems to be the problem or it's and not problem, but that's the variable you don't tolerate. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you've seen in your experience that has been useful in improving your ability to tolerate that, you know, type of training such that you're improving your tolerance capacity and can kind of improve the amount of training under the curve that you can kind of productively, um, handle. Oh man, I think, I think it depends on the reason for it. Um, like I, I think, I think some people uh, struggle with tolerating training close to failure simply due to lack of experience. And for them for a couple weeks, week one's going to suck by week three, it'll be fine. Um, some people it's, it's, it's kind of just a matter of like conditioning, like it's hard to train to failure and, uh, you know, you get one like really hard set in and you just, you just have nothing in the tank. Like it, you lay on the ground for five minutes. And then after five minutes, you're still only like 30% of the way recovered. Um, for those folks, I kind of think that either like doing, doing some short rest interval stuff or high rep stuff, um, or honestly, just going for a fucking run, <laughs> like just, just something to help improve conditioning a little bit. If that's like the, the constraint can help. Um, and then for, for some folks and like, I'm not sure the cause of this, um, but just like, hmm, they go all the way to failure and their joints just really dislike them. And that's the case, whether it's heavy loads, whether it's light loads, like they just need to keep a couple of reps in the feeling good. Um, maybe that's something they could work out with a physical therapist, but I haven't found a approach to just like prescribing normal training that, that gets them out of the woods. Like maybe changing exercise selection could help a little bit if there's like certain things that bother whatever joint it is, but I don't know. I, I, I sort of wonder if that might just be related to inflammation and like really, like really like putting a lot of stress on it, um, especially under conditions of like neuromuscular fatigue where like your joint mechanics may sl change slightly, like, uh, like th that, that might just not be good for them. And 
you're not really going to get them to a point where going to failure feels good. Man, I think we're there, fellas. Josh, anything else to add before you get us out of here? Yeah, I, I think we can quickly mention some some stuff we're working on and, and that other folks are working on to uh, get some further insight into this and in, in an applied sense and, you know, probably have, again, more questions than answers. Um, we're, as I alluded to a little bit ago, we'll basically in some of the final stages of comparing like a, a momentary failure with lower set volume sort of condition to a higher set volume non-failure condition. Um, that's a within subject study that, that we have a, a lot of, uh, a lot of measurement sites on. So that's kind of the, the bottleneck right now is, is getting all those analyzed. Um, I'm, we'll I'm really excited to see a, that. Hey, well, uh, that'll, that'll light a fire under my butt because kind of the second thing that we're also working on, that's kind of been the, the priority more so than, than getting that out the door is similar meta regressions on the training volume research for both strength and hypertrophy. Um, that's been kind of a, a, all of 2023 thing for, uh, for myself, Jake and Zach here. Um, so that's also in the final stages. So we'll kind of have some insights into what that dose response looks like. And then lastly, uh, and, and I think Zach, you're, you're directly involved in this is Martin Rafalo, who we've mentioned a couple of times here does awesome work. Um, he's in Australia, right? Or, yeah. Australia. Yeah. Australia. Um, his PhD thesis comparing, uh, momentary failure training to, I think it's two RIR training. One to, one to two RIR. Yeah. It's, one it's, two RIR. it'll, it'll be the best training study on this topic in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Which, uh, you know, a big limitation of the meta regressions or, or of, yeah, of the meta regression that we've been talking about is, is a lot of the studies were estimated in terms of RIR. Um, whereas he's doing an excellent job of controlling RIR in very well-trained folks. I'm always surprised by how well-trained his, his samples are. Uh, he, he went, I, yeah, just to give him a little bit of credit, the, the study is just extremely well done. Like he went above and beyond for a lot of different things, the way he controlled nutrition, like just it's a really, really well done project. And I hope he, yeah, he, he should be proud of what he's done. I'm excited for him to get it out there. It's cool. Yeah. And then lastly, I'll throw out your, your dissertation as well, Zach, which isn't directly like a, a volume of approximated failure study, but it is kind of effectively uh, a volume study with also Ooh. a lot of <laughs> So yeah, lot, lots of stuff to, uh, to hopefully add some insights here. Um, and with that, Greg, we are, I, I, I want you to talk for about two and a half minutes so we get to the four hour mark. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you have any closing remarks, anything you want to direct folks towards, we'll of course link Stronger by Science below. Um, but if there's anything else you want to kind of point people towards, uh, here's, here's your shot for the four people listening at this point. <laughs> Sick. Uh, sounds good. Um, yeah, I don't have much else, but I am very, very comfortable with stalling because I understand how satisfying it would be <laughs> to hit the four hour mark. Um, and I'm, I'm willing and, and able to, to accommodate you guys there. Um, just, just for some date on to close things out. I always think that it's interesting to think a little bit about how much, uh, human culture owns to the development of beer and yogurt, um, and cheese. <laughs> so one of the things you don't really think about with like ancient prehistory is that humans, uh, homo sapiens, sapiens hunter gatherers that were arranged in small tribal bands. Um, and, and there was no real civilization. So when, when we say civilization, we talk about, we're referring to a large enough conglomeration of people that folks who aren't directly blood kin um, can be in contact with each other uh, frequently enough and long enough to develop uh, in, in understanding of, of the us just outside of familial ties. And so to do that, you need to be able to cram enough people into a small enough uh, a situation where, where you can facilitate that. And so first you needed the advent of agriculture. Obviously you can't have 
millions of people in a hunter-gatherer tribe. That much is obvious. But then after you have agriculture, uh, um, the, like humans need something like five acres of arable land a piece to be able to support a family. Like that, that still requires people to be fairly spread out. So uh, essentially you needed the advent of cities. And for the advent of cities, you needed to have productive enough agriculture to get calories into the city uh, where people aren't doing agriculture, but you needed to be able to, to do that year round very reliably. Uh, the problem with with crops is and they and they go bad. And so one of the like fundamental, incredibly important things for the develop of human civilization was the advent of fermentation, because with fermentation now, instead of calories essentially having like a very finite, very short shelf life where you have to consume them or they start rotting, going bad, whatever. Now, after a harvest or a cab cabin season where you can like milk your goats and whatnot, like it was more goats than cows back then. 